Hey, what's going on everybody and welcome to this stream where we are going to be connecting a React application with a Django backend. So in this series or in this video, what we're going to be doing is building out the backend of uh, an application that we built out in yesterday's stream or sorry, in Monday's stream. So two days ago, we built out an entire React application and we never really built out a backend. So today we're going to be doing this with Django. I'm still going to build out the React application from scratch. So if anybody uh, didn't follow that video and wants to still completely follow from scratch, you can still follow along. We're gonna go a lot faster through the React portion just because that's been covered. If you want to go through the basics of React and kind of go through that crash course, you can follow that video. So uh, what we're gonna be doing here is, for anybody that's completely new, is we're gonna be continuing this notes application here. So it's a simple notes application. We can edit items, add items, remove them, and we work with a different way of adding the data along with trimming down the data to render down things like dates and little uh, body sections here with these notes. So in this application, the point of this is to show you how to connect Django and React along with building something cool. Now, if you're looking for just a quick integration, I do have a YouTube video already on uh, I already have a video on this topic. It's about 11 minutes long. I posted it a year ago or maybe a year and a half ago. So if you're just looking on how to integrate a React application into Django, follow that video and that'll get you straight to the point. In this video, we're gonna go a little bit longer because we are building out an entire application. So the whole point of it is to show you that process and build something cool. So that's what we're gonna take care of right now. Now, uh, if you're looking for if you're looking for a, like a full Django introduction, I do have some links down in the description. I have a full Django course, a React crash course, and uh, I also have a more complex Django course where we put together a full e-commerce website. These are all on Udemy. If you wanna go above and beyond, follow those, and I also have a lot of other uh, YouTube videos on these topics and the basics. So we're not really gonna be going into the basics of Django. We're just gonna be building out our API and just kinda going through this process. I'll try to explain as much as possible but yeah, we're just gonna get straight into it. So uh, let's go ahead and talk about how this is gonna work. So there's different ways of deploying a React application with Django. Uh, one way to do it, which is what I like to do, is to build them completely separately. They're gonna be running on different ports, and then I completely integrate them. So I drag my React project, once it's complete, into my Django application, and I serve it uh, from Django, and this is server-side rendering. Now. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to do it as far as maybe completely separating them. You could use something like Netlify and then deploy your Django API on one end with Heroku or something like that, and then have the Django application completely separated. They don't have to even know about each other. All they have to do is talk to each other. So um, one second, I see Praveen telling me to hide this button there. There we go. So there's a lot of different ways to do it. And what I wanna do is show you two ways. I'll try the Netlify version where I'll completely separate them. Uh, we'll have to work with something called cores where uh, because they're not in one application, we need a way for them to talk to each other. And then we'll also do the full integration. So uh, let's go ahead and just get right into it. So uh, we saw the product demo. I, re I highly recommend if you don't know React and if you wanna get an intro, check that video out because we're gonna be going a lot faster. But so. If you wanna build this out from scratch, go ahead and watch that one. It's also linked up in the video description. So at this point, uh, if you wanna get the source code to this project, if you wanna follow along in this stream, uh, this link should also be linked up in the video description. Let me know if it's not there. And uh, at some point, I'm probably gonna update it with the code that we're gonna to write today. So if the file structure is not the same, maybe the names of the files, uh, if they're not exactly the same, these will be updated later, but the link will probably remain exactly like this. So if you wanna follow along, I highly recommend, go ahead, go to GitHub, clone this, and that should get you started. So with that being said, let's go ahead and take care of the Django version first, so or the Django side. So we're gonna build out our API, so that means we're gonna set up our Django application, we'll install the Django REST framework, we'll make sure that we have an API, and after we build out our first two routes, which are gonna to be to get our notes and to get a detail of a note, we'll start with the React side. So we'll build out the React version of this, we'll make the API calls, and then we'll continue adding in different routes and different endpoints for things like adding, uh, for things like adding, updating, and deleting items. So we'll go ahead and get right in there. So source, source code link is there, I'm seeing somebody comment that. Let me just make sure that it's in here. Give me one second here. So 
just pull that up. I just want to make sure that everyone can actually follow along here. So the source code link is there. Okay, so yeah, it's all ready. Go ahead and download that. I'll give everyone a second. I'm just checking the chat here. All right, so we have 92 people in the stream right now. Let's go ahead and get started. This stream will be posted after. So for anybody that wants to watch it after and is worried about missing something, uh, this will all be posted after. I always make sure these streams are available. So the first thing is, let's go ahead and get started with the Django site. So remember, we're gonna build them out as two separate applications at this point. So let's go ahead and first make sure you have Python installed. So if anyone doesn't have that, um, I guess I'm gonna go through a little bit of a crash course. Make sure you have Python installed. We do need the pip package manager. So we're gonna be using that to install Django. And we also want to install virtual ENV after you have Python installed. So we're gonna set up our virtual environment and we're gonna use a command prompt for this at first and then I'm gonna use VS code and use that terminal. So let's go ahead and CD into whatever folder that we're gonna set up our project in. In my case, I'm just gonna keep it in the desktop. Let's see, someone's saying it's a private repo. Is that the case? Give me one second. I might've actually set it as a private repo and didn't realize that. So let's see, yeah, you're right. Okay, so it's private. Let's go ahead and change that setting here. Sorry about that. Okay, so I'll make that public and make sure to confirm that. All right, so now it should be available. Okay, so let me know if it's uh, still not working, but it should be a public repo now. So there we go, now it says it's public. Okay, so I'm gonna CD into my desktop. That's where I'm gonna keep my folder or my project. So wherever you're gonna keep it, make sure you CD into that file. And let's just first install, we'll do pip install virtual env. Okay, so there's different ways to, uh, to, have a, to set up a virtual environment. I like to use the virtual env package, so we'll just use that. If you have another option, go ahead and get that going. And technically you don't need to install the virtual environment, but it's really good to separate your application uh, so you don't, you don't have conflicts with other packages that you install and in different projects in different environments. So we're gonna set it up and make sure it's all ready. So once you have virtual env installed, pip works because of Python, we're just gonna do virtual env. And then uh, I just like to call my environment env. You can give it whatever name you want, but we're gonna set that up and that's gonna create a folder on my desktop because I ran that from my desktop. So now that I have that, I'm gonna activate my virtual environment. So we're just gonna do env backslash scripts and then activate. And I am running this from a Windows machine. So it's gonna be a little bit different on Mac. I'd recommend looking that up. And now we have our virtual environment set up. So I wanna install Django inside of this virtual environment. So we're just gonna do pip install Django. And that should give me the latest version. So that's gonna take a second here. And once we have that, we should be able to set up our project. So Give that a second here. So what we're gonna do here, one way of setting up the virtual environment, what I like to do is actually take my virtual environment and put it into my Django project so I always know where it's at. So at this point, I just installed Django here, so I'm gonna create the uh, Django project right now. So we installed it, and now we can just run Django-admin, and then we're just gonna do start project. And this is gonna set up a new Django project for us. So we're gonna do start project and then give our project a name. So we'll just do um, my notes like that. So we'll just keep it consistent like we did in the last video. So now we should have some boilerplate files here for our Django project. So if you can see my desktop, I'll just make sure that you can see everything. So we see my notes and my virtual environment. So what I'm gonna do here is actually take my virtual environment and move that into my Django project. So I like to put them together and they're gonna be in one folder now. So I see somebody asking if we have authentication in this video. No, in this case, we're not gonna do it. I have a lot of videos on that and we'll be doing a lot of React and Django authentication in the future. So uh, if you're using your command prompt, go ahead and CD into the Django project. So whatever you called it, in my case, I called it my notes. So go ahead and CD into it and then just turn on your server. So you can just do python manage.py run server. So that's gonna get your Django project started and it's gonna turn up or start up your uh, development server. So what I'm gonna do is actually close this out and I'm gonna open this up from VS Code. So I'm gonna go ahead and prep this and I'm gonna use a VS Code terminal. So we'll go into the folder and this is definitely my favorite text editor, the 
theme that I'm using is Adam One Dark Pro for anybody that wants to follow that. So we're going to open up our Django project, the one on our desktop, and here are our files here. So I see the virtual environment, my Django project with some default files here and some folders. So from the terminal, you could just do control tilde. And that's on the top left of your keyboard. Usually it's like this weird looking back tick thing, or you could just go into terminal and just do new terminal and go ahead and start that up. And that should be in your Django project already. So make sure the file path is there. And now let's actually turn on that server. So we'll just do Python manage.py run server. Okay, so all we did was install Django. We turned on our server. Don't worry about these errors. We'll take care of that in a little bit here. So let's go ahead and check that out. Make sure it's all working. So it should be on port 8000. So copy that right there, put that in your browser and I actually have to turn off my other server. So give me one second. Need to make sure that's off. So now on port 8000, what I do is usually save that tab. So all I have to do is click this link right here and that will get me there. If not, just go ahead and write that out and open up port 8000. So our Django project setup, we're going a little bit slow and we're going to start moving up here. So we have that set up. What I want to do is build my first app in Django. And if you don't understand what apps are, uh, that's also covered in my course. I have a couple of videos on that, but basically a Django project is constructed of multiple apps. And these apps are where you contain all your business logic, where we're going to build out our API and our database and so on. So things like that, that's all going to be inside of an app. So here's a Django project. So let's go ahead and we'll leave the server on, but now we want to start our app. So I'm going to open up a new terminal. If you're using the command prompt, you could just open one up or another one up, or you could turn it off or turn off your server and uh, just run this command again. So what we're going to run now is Python manage.py. And then we'll just do start app and I'm going to call my app. Um, in this case, we're only going to have an API and I typically like to manually generate my API by creating the folders. But in this case, I'm just going to call it API and build it out of an app here because I'm just going to keep the database and all that inside of one app. So the entire API is inside of an app. So once I run that, here we go. We see that folder. We see our models where, and this is where we're going to design our database. We have our views and we're going to build out our API. So let's connect our app really quick. So at this point, uh, what I want to do is go into my project here. So the root directory inside of the main project folders inside of settings.py. We talk a lot about this inside of my Django course. So if you want to get familiar with it on YouTube or Udemy, I have that. So we need to connect our app to our Django main project here. So let's go ahead and go into our app. So we're just going to go ahead and add this to installed apps. We'll go into API. So we're going into this folder here. And we need to point to apps.py and we need to point to this config folder. What this is going to do is connect our core Django project to the app that we just added. And that app is going to sit inside of our Django project. So you can see that file structure there. So we'll go into api.apps. So we're going into that folder and we're going into app config. Okay, so we connected the project here and I'm just going to go ahead and install this for VS Code. It's just a Python thing here. So we'll give that a second. If you see those kind of things, uh, I guess do what you feel is best. I just by default install those. So we connected the app and what I want to do is just generate some kind of URL and connect that. So let's go into our app, which is API here. We'll go into views and I'm just going to import a simple uh, JSON response method here. So we'll just do from Django dot HTTP and we'll just do import JSON response. So we just want a view that's going to render out a simple JSON response. So we'll create the view right now and let's just call this get routes. So this view is just going to specify all the routes inside of my application. We need to pass in the request object to that for the HTTP request and we'll just do return. And then we can do HTTP or JSON response. And at this point, we'll just say, um, let's just say our API or something like that. So we just want to be able to see it. So our API and then inside of a JSON response, we need to pass in save and we're going to set this to false and safe just basically means if I'm going to, if I remember it right, whoops, I turned on my phone there. So this just basically means that I can return back more data than just a Python dictionary. So, uh, that's what safe is going to do for us. If I explain that correctly and let's go ahead and call this route now. So we created our first route and we want to go into our API now, the API folder, 
and let's create a new file for our URLs. So we're going to call this URLs.py. And in here, we're going to create all the URL routing for our app. So every single route that the user goes to, or you can think of it as a page. So every single endpoint that the user goes to, this is what we're going to, uh, where we're going to configure it. So we're going to make a quick import. So from Django dot URLs, we're just going to import path here. So we need that. We also want to import our views. So they're in the same file structure. So let's just go ahead and get this view so we can render that. So we'll just do from and then the same directory, we just import views like that. Now we actually need to create the URL pattern. So we'll just do URL patterns. So why not write an ordinary API? Well, um, in this case, I'm only doing this in side of I'm only creating my database inside of one app. So there's no need to actually separate the database from the API. So that's why I'm just making it quicker here. So URL patterns, this is going to be a Python list. And we're going to use the path method to specify the path. So the path method is going to specify the route that we need to go to. So in this case, the first route is just going to be an empty string that's going to be like the home page, then we need to specify the view to trigger this on. So we're just going into the views folder. And we're going to render get route and somebody asked me why I'm camel casing this uh, for functions, I always camel case them for classes, I just make sure that every single first letter is capitalized. Uh, it's just a a form of doing it. it's more of a my preference. So in this case, uh, I will add a name here. So we'll just do get or we'll just do routes like this. So we can also add a name to the path and that allows us to access this dynamically. Not sure if we'll use that. So we created a view that's going to give us this response and a JSON response, we have a URL. And the last thing to do here is to connect this apps URLs file here. So we have a URLs.py file, we need to connect this to our main project here. So in the root directory, if we go to my notes, let's go into the root directories URLs.py file. So there's two URLs file right now or URL files. And in here, we're first going to use the include method. And we're going to create a pattern for that API route. So in order to go into the API URLs file, we're just going to go ahead and specify the empty string which means that when we set this as a path, go ahead and use the include method, and then go into API. So into this folder, and then go into this URLs file. So we'll go into api.urls. So we're basically saying, let this file take care of all the routing for every path that starts with this. So now this file will take care of it. And let's check this out. Let's see if we have any errors. So we do have one error uh, inside of settings.py. We have API and then this is supposed to be API config. Sorry about that. So it's supposed to be the app name right there. Okay, so now it looks good on port 8000. Everything should be running correctly. So let's check this out. If I refresh it now we don't get the default uh, response there we see our API. So that's what we just set up in the view. So we just connected this. So what I'm going to do here is actually add in some endpoints so we can actually see what the routes are going to look like. So in this case, I'm just going to copy and paste a Python list of dictionaries. So we're just going to copy something from my source code. So that's actually inside of the project inside of GitHub here. If you want to go in here, go to uh, in this case, it's no API, and then we're going into the API folder in views. And we're just copying this right here. So let's just grab all of this. And you don't need to do this part. I'm just specifying some routes here and the methods that are going to go with it. So I'm going to minimize the terminal here. And let's bring this into our views here. So inside of get routes here, the whole purpose of this view is to specify all the endpoints. So once I do this, I'm going to take routes here. And I'm just going to pass that in here instead of our API. So we'll just do routes. And that's not going to be in a quote. Okay, so now in our API response, we should see this. So it looks a little bit ugly right now. This is what the Django REST framework is going to take care of for us. So we'll do that in a second. But at this point, here are the routes here. So the first endpoint is going to be forward slash notes. Now this is going to give us a JSON response of all the objects or all the notes inside of our database. The method here is going to be get and then the body. Well, we don't need to specify anything in the body. So that's just set to none. And then the, the description of how it works and what's happening. Now, the next endpoint is going to be to get a single note. So in this case, we're going to notes, and then we're passing in the note ID. And this is how we're going to query the database for a specific note. 
the method is going to be get and then if we continue here to create a note this is going to be a post method we pass in what we need for the body and so on so this is what we're going to be building out and we have that inside of our first view so i'm just going to minimize that and that's all in here now okay so the next step here is going to be to set up our database so now what i'm going to do here is create a model and that's going to be inside of our app here the api app and in models.py for anyone that isn't too familiar with django this is where we create our database replica of how we want our database tables to look like so in this case we're using python classes that inherit from a django model and then every single class is going to represent a table on our database or in the database and the attributes are going to represent columns the instances of each model are going to be the rows in the database so uh, someone's asking why we don't use JSON formatter. Well, we're not going to need it, especially once we work with the, the REST or the Django REST framework. It's going to be way easier than that. And also JSON response uh, works just fine. So let's go ahead and actually design our database. In this case, we're only going to have one model here, and this is going to be for our note. So let's go ahead and start building this out. So in this case, it's going to be a Python class. So we'll do class. We're going to call this note. And this needs to inherit from models here. So that's already imported by default. So we'll just do models and then we'll just do model. And the model is going to be with a capital M. Now for the attributes, I'm just going to specify the body here. And this is going to go from models dot text field. So it's going to be a text field. And let's see, I'm going to set null to true and blank also to true for now. Usually I change these, but this just means that it can be saved in the database without an actual attribute value. So that's null. And then blank also means that we can't submit a form or we can submit a form with no values. If this was set to false, which is what that is by default, then we wouldn't be able to actually submit these values. Okay, so I'm just gonna bring my face and I realized it wasn't in the frame here. Okay, so after that, we want an updated value. So we want to know when a note was updated. So we're just going to do models dot, and then we'll just do date time field. And in this case, for the updated value, we're going to set auto underscore now to true here. So auto now means that every single time the save method is run on this method. So every time we save a note, it's going to take a timestamp of when we saved that note and added it or updated it in the database. Now the next value is going to be created and created is going to be a lot like updated here. So we're going to do models dot date time field, and then we're going to specify auto now, and then we're going to do add, and that will also be true. So the difference between auto now and auto now add is that auto now add only takes a timestamp on the creation of that model. So on the first creation of the note, we'll take a timestamp. We know when it's created. And then next time we save it, this will not take that timestamp, but updated will because this is auto now on each save and then auto now add is on the add or on the original creation of it. So that's the difference between the two. Now, what I'm going to do is also create a string representation of it. So this is a Python class. We want to make sure it looks good uh, as far as the string representation when we use this from the admin panel. So we'll create the string method, pass in self, and let's just return the body here. So we'll just do self dot body and we're just going to do the first 50 characters so when i'm saving this a lot of these notes can be extremely long so we only want to get the first 50 characters and trim that down so that'll look a little bit cleaner and that's it so that's the only item we're going to have in our database and now if i open up my command prompt i'm actually going to turn off the server and we want to take care of this issue first so what I'm going to do here is run my first migrations. So this is telling me to run Python manage.py migrate. Now, if you have the basics of Django uh, already figured out and you understand this, uh, you know that we start with an SQLite database by default. It's right here uh, in more of a production environment. I'd move to something like Postgres or MySQL, but Django gives us an SQLite database to start with. So it's just this file right here and it's good for development. So we're going to run these migrations and what's happening here is Django already has some default tables built in for us for things like our user for sessions and uh, different items in our database. So Django has these prepped and when we run migrate, we're just getting all those preparations, these migrations, which are basically like SQL commands and we're going to execute them and these are going to build out our database tables. So we'll just run that really quick. So Python manage.py migrate and that just ran our first initial migrations 
So if I want to add this model to the database, the first thing I need to do is I need to run Python manage dot py make migrations. So what that's going to do is it's going to create a migrations file here. And if we look at that, this is the first migration. It just generated this. And it's saying that when we run our migrate command, this is what we're going to execute and build out in the database. So now we need to execute that. So make migrations to prep the migrations. And then we need to execute that. So let's just do Python manage dot py migrate. So that's going to take this migration and now execute it. So we're going to see applying the migrations and we just applied all the migrations inside of that file. So that was done really quick for us. One of the really cool things about Django and its built in ORM makes this process really easy. So sorry about going slow here. Uh, we're just going through the first steps as slow as possible and then we'll go faster here. So we have our migrations made. So we have our database set up. And at this point, I need to create a user. So one of the tables that was auto generated for us was a, a user table. So we don't actually see the model here, but we already have one. And in order to access the Django admin panel, so let's actually try this. So Python manage.py run server, almost forgot the command here. So if we go to our root directories urls.py file, let's take a look at this. So inside of our main project, so my notes, URLs, we have this path and it goes into forward slash admin. So if we want to go to the admin panel and actually view our data, we just go to port 8000 forward slash admin, and we should be able to just log in and go into the admin panel and actually see our database. This is like a viewport and a simple way of working with the database. So what we're going to do here is actually create a user to access that. So we can't access that table or that admin panel until we create a user to actually log in. So I'm going to turn off my server and let's just go ahead and actually create a user. So we'll do Python manage.py create super user. And then we just hit enter. And if I'm going to leave this blank, that means it's going to name my user Dennis Ivy based on my computer name, or I could just write it out like that, whatever I want here that I'll create it. It's going to ask me for an email. We'll just use some kind of some kind of fake email. We'll just do Dennis at email.com. And then I'll type in some kind of password. So as I'm typing, we're not going to see the password, but it is being typed in. It's just going to confirm it for us. And let's run our server again. Someone's asking me why I'm not doing harder projects. I actually am going to be adding in tougher projects. But at the same time, I also have why can't I run that? Uh, I also do have uh, tougher projects on Django and React, specifically on Udemy, where we create a full e-commerce website. So, okay, I keep running run servers while I'm talking. Okay, so the server is on now. There we go. Okay, so now that I'm in here, I can go to the admin panel, and my password should be auto-filled. So just go ahead and type in your credentials. And here we can see some default tables. So I see the user I just created, and in order to actually see the database table that I just added, the models one, what I'm going to do is go into my app here. So API and we'll just go into admin.py and I need to import my model and then register it with the admin panel. This isn't a necessary step, but if you want to use your models inside of the admin panel, you do need to register them. So let's go ahead and go into the models folder. So we'll just do dot models. It's in the same directory right here and we'll just do import note. So that was the model name. We're just grabbing this, importing it. And then we just need to register this. This is going to be admin.site.register. So we're passing in note. And now if I refresh it, we should see this note. This dang pop-up keeps messing up. So if I refresh it, there we go. We have our notes here. So let me try to zoom in here. So we have our notes. And let's just go ahead and add a few notes. So we'll just say note number one. And then... We'll just do one, two, three here. So let's make a replica of a note. We'll just do two of these. And then the next one, we'll just do second note. Okay, so we're actually able to deal with CRUD functionality from the admin panel. Now we want to build this out on our own. This is just good for uh, getting set up really quickly, but we don't want to actually have to handle this from the Django admin panel. We want our own system here. So I just added some notes really quick. And the purpose of this was to get the first part of our API built out. And we just want to be able to query our database and render these items out after we serialize them. So 
now that we have two nodes, let's go ahead and move on to the next section. And that is to, to work with the Django REST framework. So the Django REST framework is an awesome package built on top of Django that allows us to make APIs with Django. So we could do all of this manually. We could try to serialize our uh, objects here and try to render those out. But there's a lot of built-in methods that the Django REST framework gives us. So we're going to install it and then work with that. So let's go ahead and open up Django REST framework. So this is the documentation. It's a package on top of Django. So the uh, Django docs are going to be a little bit different from the Django REST framework docs. And let's just go ahead and get this installed here. So here we see this pip install. So it's pip install Django REST framework. And then we need to add it to installed apps. So let's take care of this now. So we'll minimize that terminal. Okay, and let's go into actually we want to do that from our terminal. So I'm just going to open up a new one here, copy and paste that. So it's pip install Django REST framework, all as one word. So I just want to make sure you can see that. So we're going to run that pip install and hit enter. For some reason that did not run. So one second, I might have to do Python dash M pip install Django rest framework. Okay. So that took care of it. So just because of my setup, I have to run Python dash M. You might not have to do that. So go ahead and run that install. That'll give you the latest version of the Django rest framework. And then we need to add in rest underscore framework to installed apps inside of settings.py. So read through the documentation, follow along. It's really good to follow tutorials, but also read the documentation yourself. And you might find something or maybe uh, better understand something that was said inside of a tutorial like this. So I'm going to add this just underneath my first app installation here. So that's rest framework. And we just added that. So we ran the pip install and now rest framework is installed. So what I want to do next here is actually start working with Django rest framework views instead of the default views that I have here. So if we go into views at this point, we're just using JSON response and this is already built into Django. It's a simple JSON response, but it's actually not that powerful. If we look at our API here, it's very plain. It gives us our data in a plain format and we want to have some styling to this along with the advanced methods that we get with it. So let's go ahead and change this up a little bit. So now that we have the Django rest framework installed, what we can do is actually import a package called response and then actually use that to return our data. So we're going to completely get rid of this and we're just going to do from rest underscore framework and we're just going to import response and that's going to be with a capital R. So we have response here and now all we need to do is take response and change that from a JSON response to use the response import. Let's see. And that's from rest framework dot response here. So we want to change that. And there we go. Okay. So now in order to use this, I need to tell this view to be a view using the Django rest framework. So uh, there's class based views and there's also function based views. I really like function based views, uh, especially in tutorials like this. So what we're going to do here is use a decorator on our function base view and change up this route here. So remember, I didn't delete my routes. I just minimized them. So they're still here. So let's go ahead and import that decorator. So we'll just do from rest framework dot decorators. Let's just import API underscore view. So we're going to import that. And here just above the function or the view, we can just do at API underscore view. Then what we need to do is pass in a list here and we need to specify all the methods that are going to be allowed to this view. So these are the HTTP methods. So get put post delete. Uh, you can add in multiple. In this case, I only want a get request at this point. So there's no need to send a post request to this view. So that's all we're going to allow. So that means if someone tries to send a post request to this view, it will not work. If we wanted to add it, then we would just do post and then continue on like that. So now that I have this, let's see, where is that? Okay, here we go. Let's check this out. So if I refresh this, uh, safe. Okay. I don't need safe with response. So we need to remove that. That's only for the JSON response. So that's also a little bit nicer about this method. If I refresh that, there we go. So what I get now is my JSON response, but it's more formatted. So I still call this data like I would any other API, but 
when I go directly to it, I get to see my information right here formatted uh, like this. It tells me some information about it. It looks a little bit nicer. We see the indentation and it just looks a lot cleaner. Now, if I want to actually view this as simple JSON data, I can just click on that and it adds that to the end of the URL and formats it for me. So here are all my options here for this route, it tells me the method and so on. So it's a lot cleaner, not that cool right now. All it did was style uh, just our REST API here. So we have that built out. And what I'm gonna do here is add in another route here really quick or two more routes. And the next one here is gonna be to get all of our notes from our database. So we're just rendering out this Python list right here, all these uh, dictionaries in that Python list but we wanna actually get some data from the database, the things that we added in our admin panel. So we added some notes here. We want to query the database and then render these out as a, uh, inside of our API and these need to be serialized before we can do that. So these Python objects need to be serialized before we can actually render them out. So let's go ahead and do this real quick. So we're gonna create another method here and we're just gonna call this get notes. So we'll uh, go ahead and just pass in request here. Let's put the decorator above it. So we'll just do API underscore view. And this is gonna take a get request. Then for the return method, we'll just do return response. And we're just gonna pass in our notes. For now, I'm just gonna pass in a string like that. So we'll just do notes and that's it. So for the URL, I need to connect the URL now. We're gonna create another path here and we're just going to notes like that with no forward slash. So we're just going to notes and we're going to views dot get notes and let's pass in the name and we'll just throw in notes like that. So we just created a route and let's check that out here. So now if I go to my API, so port 8000 forward slash notes, now we see this. So there's our response. We want to actually get that data now. So we have another route to get our notes now. So let's go ahead and actually query this data. And before we can do that, uh, typically inside of Django, what we could do is just import our notes. So we're just gonna go into models here and then we're just gonna import note like that. Then we can go into our view here. We can just go into notes. Then we can do note.objects.all. That's gonna get all the notes from the database. Now, this can't be passed in right here. These are a, this is a list or a query set of Python objects here. So what we need to do is serialize the data and that means it's gonna take our Python objects and turn those into JSON format. So in order to do that, we need to create some serializers. So inside of our app, the API app, we're gonna create a new file and we're gonna call this serializers. Okay, so that's serializers.py. Now we're only gonna have one serializer here, but typically I would create a file for that and then just add in all the serializers. So later on, if we had different models and objects, we would serialize those too. But for now, we only have the one. So inside of our serializers.py file, we're just gonna do from rest framework dot serializers. We're just gonna import model serializer. So we have that import and now for the actual serializer, all we're gonna do is we're gonna create a class here and this is gonna be a serializer for a specific model. So the method that I like to use is put the model name and then just add in serializer after. So we're gonna specify the model, that's the note, and then we're just gonna do serializer. So serializer, I can never spell serializer, it's a weird word for me. Okay, so note serializer, did I spell that right? Yeah, that looks correct so far. If I misspelled that, let me know. I'll try to watch the chat here. Okay, so we have that serializer and then we imported model serializer. So there's different types of serializers that we can make. So in this case, we're gonna use model serializer that we just imported. And for a model serializer, all we need to do is specify the model name. So we'll specify the model, which is gonna be imported. We'll just do from models import note and we need to specify the model that we're gonna serialize and then the fields that we want to actually allow here. So the fields that we want to serialize. So in this case, I'm just gonna do all like that. So this means every single attribute in this model, serialize all of these. Now, if I only wanted to serialize the body, I could just add that in a list here. So this would be a list and I could say body and then another field I can just do updated 
and so on. So I can manually specify these or I can just say, go ahead and give us all the fields. So now that I have my serializer, let's go ahead and save it. And let's go into our views and import that. So we're just going into from serializers. So it's in the same file structure right here. Let's import note serializer. Okay, so we have that serializer imported and we're just gonna go ahead and specify a variable. So we're gonna call this serializer. I keep saying serializer, I'm actually annoyed of myself right now. And in this case, we're gonna use the note serializer. So we're using that import that we just made. We're passing that in and we need to tell the note serializer what we wanna do here. So we're gonna pass in the notes into that serializer. Then we need to specify many and this is gonna be either true or false. And what this means is, do we want to serialize multiple objects or a single object? So in this case, we're gonna pass in just one object here or multiple objects. So that means we're gonna return back a query set. Now, serializer itself is gonna be an object. So to return this to the front end, we're gonna do serializer.data. So we wanna get the data out of the serializer. So we'll go ahead and save that and let's go to get notes now. So we got the notes, we serialize them, and then we return that specifically the data value there. So now if I refresh this, we're inside of the notes route. If I refresh that, here we go. So we have a list and now this is JSON data. We see the first object. So we see uh, or we see the first note, then we see the second note with the timestamps. I see John Wood is in here. Good to see you, John. So we uh, serialize the objects and now we have our data. So that's the first part of our API. And I'm gonna do, or I'm gonna make one more route here. And that's gonna be to get a single note. And then we're gonna go to the React part and build out the front end and actually get this data. So let's go ahead and add in a new route. And for this, all I'm gonna do is copy this route right here. And I'm gonna change this to get note. So it's a single note now. The method is still gonna be get. And in this case, we need to pass in the primary key. So the ID of the specific note that we wanna get. Then for the query method here, we're gonna do get instead of all. And we are going into the ID attribute and we're gonna say, go ahead and get the parameter that we get out, the parameter that we get out of the URL, which is gonna be PK. So the current ID, go ahead and filter the notes and get the current note that value or that matches that value. So we're getting the note we're passing it into the same serializer, so it's the same object, and we're gonna specify many to false here. That means we only wanna serialize one single object. So we have the method, so it's get note, just making sure everything's good. And now we wanna create the URL parameter for that. So we'll go to URLs, and at this point, let's just copy notes here, and let's just pass in the angle brackets here. We'll do str, so I'm gonna set that to a string value and we'll just pass in the primary key. So we call that PK here. That means we need to call that PK inside of the view here. So we'll save that. And then the method is gonna be get note, not get notes. That's gonna be note. So I just remove the S here out of these two. Here, I'm gonna leave it like that because that's typically how you build out a RESTful API. You would still specify the query set name and then you can pass in a parameter after. So at this point, what we're gonna do is we're gonna make our API just a standard API, and then at the end, if we have time, I'll make it actually uh, follow RESTful practices. So there's a difference between an API and a RESTful API. So I'll kind of show you the difference there. So let's go ahead and save that. And at this point, if we go to that URL, we should get back a single object. So in order to get this note, all I have to do is go to notes and then pass in the ID. And there we go. So we see this object, if I go to the first one, so ID number one, we get the first or the note with the ID of one. If I go to three, because we don't have that ID, I'm gonna get an error. So that means that we don't have a query set that matches that. I could write a condition that checks for that. At this point, we're just gonna leave it. So uh, let's go ahead and continue here. So somebody's asking about model view sets. I've used those before. I'm actually not a big fan of them. And my biggest issue with this is when I'm teaching people the beginner levels of this kind of stuff. Uh, there's a lot of magic that happens under the hood that people don't understand. And uh, while you could create the views, it makes it hard to understand what's actually going on. So that's why I prefer starting with function based views. And somebody's asking for my wallpaper. Uh, I'll just have to link that up. It's just a picture. Um, I'll just link that up maybe in the source code. So I'll just put it there. Okay. So 
we got the first part done. We have our backend, we have a database, and we have an API with two endpoints. So we can get a single note and we can get a list of notes. So let's move on to the React portion of this. So we still have some things to do on the back end. We still we are still going to come back to this, but now what I'm going to do is open up a completely new project and we're going to start the React portion and then just work with uh, with both servers on here. So at this point for the React project, make sure that you have npm or a Node.js installed. This is in the tutorial that we did on Monday or two days ago. Make sure you have Node.js installed. We do need the npm package manager and we also need npx, which helps us execute these commands. So let's go ahead and run that. So we're gonna do this from the command prompt. So I still have VS Code open with my Django project and we're just gonna CD into my desktop. So I'm gonna keep both projects on my desktop. They're gonna be next to each other and I'm just gonna do npx. Remember, make sure you have Node.js installed. So go to nodejs.org and just download whatever version you want. I would recommend the LTS version. So download that first and then run npx create dash react dash app. So just like Django dash admin start project created our Django boilerplate files for us, create react app will do the same. There's different ways to create react apps, um, but this is gonna give us that core boilerplate file structure without having to manually do it for us and it's gonna configure a lot. So uh, at this point, let's just call our react project front end like that, front end. So you can call it whatever you want. In my case, my React project is gonna sit inside of my Django project. So I have my main project and then this is gonna take care of everything on the front end. So that's why I'll call it that. So you can name it whatever you want. Uh, this is gonna take a few minutes here, maybe one to two minutes. So I'll just uh, watch the chat for a second. So while this is happening, let's jump into the chat. So let's see, who do we have here? So somebody's asking, how can we, can you please show us how to query params like that where we add in the question mark? That's, um, I mean, I do that in tutorials. That's a simple search parameter. You would just add in that URL as you're showing right now. And you would just have to, in the back end. So let's say that was your request right there. Let's say you did forward slash notes and then the ID. In the back end, because that's coming from a get request, you would do something like this where you can go into request dot get and then you can do dot get use the get method and then you would just grab the id so if the method is oh one second here we go okay so you would just do that right there so you would just say something like id is equal to or param whatever you want to call your variable and then you would just do request dot get so you're getting the get method from the request object and then you're getting the id value so in this case um your name of that parameter is ID. So if you called it anything else, you would just change the name for it. So I hope that answers the question. I guess that one wasn't that hard to uh, show. So the React project is still installing. Let's see, change notes to get note. Where is that? Okay, so we have get notes and get note. I don't know what you mean by that. Let's see in the URLs. That looks good to me. I'm not sure what you mean by that or maybe that was just earlier. Good to have everyone here, let's see. <laughs> Appreciate that, appreciate the hellos here, everybody. I'm hearing a lot of stories about people getting jobs by learning this kind of stuff. It's so cool to hear. If you have those, share them with me. I absolutely love, love seeing this kind of stuff. Okay, so let's see, someone said, I didn't get the Django REST framework error response format, errors inside of errors. Can you show us how to handle that? So the API can be easy, easily integrated in the front end. Well, there is, uh, let's see, if you go into the Django REST framework documentation, let's see, somewhere here, you can see, uh, you can work on the error handling section and there's ways to create your own custom errors. So you can actually generate your own status code. So I'd recommend importing status and then have some kind of response uh, or have some kind of uh, logic in your view that checks for these errors and then render out your own responses. You can specify the message that comes with it and then the type of response or error response that you're gonna generate if a specific error occurs. So I'd recommend working with that. All right, so the React app is done. So we're gonna to get to that now. So just wanted to spend a minute in the chat and let's continue. So the React app just got set up here. At this point, 
Uh, we already did this in the tutorial, but you could CD into your React app. At this point, it's not going to be in our Django project. So go ahead and CD into that if you're working from your command prompt. And then just do npm start like that. And that's going to start your development server. And if I start that, we're going to see this pop up in a second. It's going to open up my base React project. So just like we got the Django base project, now we have the React project running on port 3000. So this is what React set up here. So I won't go into a full description of React. We're just going to start building. Watch the last stream or the full course in the video description. Okay, so let's continue here. So I'm going to open up VS Code here and I'm going to open up a new window. So I'm going to completely separate the two right now. So now inside of this project, I'm going to open up the folder and that was on my desktop and I called that front end. So go ahead and open up the new React file if you're following along or if you're watching this after. And here are my core React projects. If you follow the last stream or the crash course linked in the video description, uh, you'll know that we're going to work with the source folder. So this is where we're going to build out our app here. So let's go ahead and clean a few things up. So the first thing is I'm going to remove setup test right here. So this is inside of source. We'll remove that at this point. I don't need these. So we'll just get rid of these folders. We'll get rid of report web vitals. We'll get rid of logo.svg and we'll get rid of index.css and then app.test.js. And we're just going to be left with index.js, app.js, and app.css. Now, in my development server, I am going to get errors. So if I open up that React project on port 3000, we're going to see some errors here. So let's fix this really quick. So let's go ahead and go back here. We'll go into app.js. Let's first get rid of the logo. Then inside of the app component, let's get rid of everything from header, from the opening to the closing tab. We'll save that. Then in index.js, let's get rid of web vitals here. So we imported that. Now we don't have it, so we're going to get rid of it. We'll get rid of that import and index.css. And then let's go into our CSS file, so app.css. And let's get rid of everything from here to down here. Okay, so now we have our base React project. If I refresh that, we have nothing in here. Let's just go ahead and add something so we can see it. So there is hot reloading. So if I just add in my app, we'll save that. And that is going to appear here. So that is my React project. This is all we have at this point. Remember, if you're not following along here for the React stuff, if things don't make sense, watch the video in the link description. That's the full stream to the React Crash Course. And there's also the Udemy course for that. So we have our React project. And what we're going to do here is we're going to build out some basic components. We're going to call the API data. So I want to connect Django with React. Then we'll style it. We'll add in all the closing routes like delete, create, and update. And then we're going to officially link the two by adding in React into Django. So we're going to take care of building out the components and then calling the data. So at this point, what I'm going to do here is create a folder for our components. So we'll create our components here. And we're going to create a folder for our pages. Remember, everything in React is still going to be a component, but some components will represent pages, while others will represent uh, actual components inside of the UI. So uh, let's go ahead and first create a header component. So we'll create a new file, and we're going to call this header.js. And I'm using a shortcut here called React or ES7. So ES7 code snippets, I talk about this in the stream and I have these shortcut methods that I'm going to type out that are going to generate React components and imports. So we have a list of shortcut methods here and then this is going to generate this code if I type in little shortcuts like that. And also my components will be generated using these shortcuts. So I'm using uh, arrow function components. So in this case, I'm going to do a shortcut like RAFCE, which stands for React Arrow Functional Component Exported, and that's going to generate a component for me like that. So that's a good one. And then auto rename tag is something that I use. This helps me generate or edit a tag here. So if I start to edit an opening part of a tag, the closing tag will also be edited. So I don't have to fix both ends. So you type component. I'll fix that here in a second. So auto rename tag is good. And then I also have something called prettier. I talked about this in the last video, but we'll recap it. Prettier code formatter. This allows me to save as I'm coding and it just indents my code and fixes it 
according to the language that it's supposed to be working with. So let's see, did I misspell components? I did, okay, we'll rename that components. There we go. So we have a header component and I'm gonna use that shortcut. So we're gonna do R-A-F-C-E, -A so React Arrow Function Component Exported. We're using function-based components. And here we have a function with a return method and that's returning back our HTML or JSX. So in this case, let's just go ahead and add this. We'll add in an H1 tag and we'll just say our header. So we have the first component and we are gonna go into app.js, import this component and then add it to our application or to our main page. So we'll just do import, which I can do IMP. That's a shortcut from the ES7 code snippets. And if you're using VS code, you can install that. And then we're going into the components folder and we are going into header. So we'll just import header. So import header from components and then we're going to header.js. And to use a component here, we can just do header like that. That's with a capital H. If I save that, this component is now imported into my application. So we have our page and we have our header component. All right, so let's move on to our notes page now. So now we actually want to create a page and get some data. So we're first gonna get, make an API call. This is all gonna be within one page and then we'll use the React router to actually add in some pages. So we'll go into the pages folder and in here we'll just do notes list page.js. So we're gonna go ahead and create the React arrow function component exported. And for anybody that doesn't know how that works, the shortcut generates the component name based off of the file name. So we'll just call this notes here. We won't add any tags here. We'll just throw in notes like that. And let's bring this into app.js also. So we'll just go ahead and import. In this case, the import is going into forward slash pages and we're going into notes list page and we need to import, I made the wrong kind of import, so we need to import notes list page like that. So I did IMD, which is a destructured import. So we'll save that, then let's grab that import and we'll just do notes list page forward slash and close that off. Okay, so we have our header and we have our notes list page. I see Shubo is in the chat, that's my designer does awesome work, he designed this app. At this point, all we've done was build out our Django backend with the API, and we just started with the React side. So that's all you missed, Shuvo, for anybody else that's catching up. And let's see. Okay, so there we go. So we see our notes component and we see our header component. Yeah, Shuvo, this is gonna be a little bit of a recap of what we did on Monday, but it's gonna be a lot faster because I'm just connecting the two. So before we start working with different pages, let's actually uh, make some API calls and query that database. So we're gonna call the Django backend. At this point, we have two text editors open, or if you're using the command prompt, we have two terminals open. So we have our port 8000 running, that's where our API is at, and we have port 3000. This is our React front end, and it looks like I actually turned it off. So let's just do npm start. Turn that back on. All right. Looks like I already had it on. That's weird. Give me one second. Let's see. I thought I completely had it off, but apparently not. So NPM start. And it says I'm already running on port 3000. Not sure why. I may have opened that up for my command prompt. Yes, I think I did this. If anyone sees what I'm missing here, I can't figure out what I did. Let's try that one more time. So npm start. Okay, there we go. So I must have uh, had it on in the command prompt. Okay, so uh, we talked about state in the stream on Monday, two days ago. So now what we're going to do, yeah, I see someone just called that out there. So it's on the command prompt. Uh, we're going to work with state and we're actually going to get some data. So I won't explain what state is. I might recap it really quickly, but we can go into our notes list page and in our function based components, we're going to use react hooks here. So with react hooks or with yeah, with React hooks, we can now add state to function-based components. So we're gonna import use state here. 
and then we're going to import use effect. So use effect is going to replicate our lifecycle methods of component did mount, component uh, did update, and component will unmount. So we did a full breakdown of that. Check that one out. But at this point, let's just go ahead and do let here. And we're going to use the use state method. So this is the initial state of our application or of this, this specific component or page. And the initial state of our notes is going to be an empty array. We don't have any data in here, so it's going to be empty. Now, the use state method is going to return back the value. So that's going to be the notes and then a way to update the notes. So to update the state. So we're going to pass in set notes. So we have the value and a way to update it. So use state just returns this array and we destructure that. So now that we have that, we're going to go ahead and use use effect here. And use effect is a, another hook that takes in an arrow function. And at the end of it, we have an optional parameter here to pass in a list of dependencies. And we're going to do that. We're going to pass in our dependencies. So this is the dependencies on when use effect fires off again. And now what we want to do is create a function to get our notes. So inside of this component, we're going to create a method called get notes. And we're going to use async await. So if you're not familiar with this or promises, I recommend checking this, you know, go look up some tutorials online. This is a JavaScript concept here. So async await, if you don't know it, try following along. You should be able to follow it and then study it later. So in order to use await, we have to make an async function. So we're going to create an arrow function. And let's go ahead and first make our call. So we're going to use the fetch API. So there's also Axios. There's different ways to do it. In this case, I'm going to use fetch. And we're just going to specify the endpoint that we want to make this call to. So in this case, we want to go to our API and we're going to go to notes here and just get this data. So at this point, what I actually want to do is I want to go back to my Django application and I actually want to update the URLs here. So when we go to notes, because I'm going to host my Django application inside of, or my react app inside of Django, I actually want this to start with API. So every single route that starts with an API will be sent to this route right here. So we're going to go into API forward slash notes, API forward slash notes, and then the ID. So the routes are going to change up a little bit. So now if I go to that route, it's not going to work. I just need to add in API like that. Okay, so API notes on poor 8000. So let's go ahead and grab that. We're going to go in here and let's see. In fetch, we're going to pass this inside of the quotes here. We're throwing that in. So it's going to make an API. It's going to be a get request by default. And we want to get these notes. And in this case, I am going to set the response here. So this is going to be response. It's going to be a variable. It's going to be the response that we get from our API. We're going to use a wait. So we're going to wait for that data to come back. Then we need to parse it. We're going to do let data and we're just going to do response dot json so that's something that we have to do with the fetch api so if we don't use a wait here what's going to happen is we're actually going to return back a promise which isn't going to be the data so we use a wait to basically say wait till this method right here is done before we continue with the next one so it slows it down and it actually allows us to get the response so at this point what i can do is i can take set notes and I can update this state right here. So we're going to take this data. So this response right here, we want to take this and then pass that into our state so we can actually render that out in our component. So in order to do that, we use the set state or the set notes method. And we're just going to pass in the data and that's going to be a JSON response. So let's just console that out. We'll just do console.log and let's see what that response was. So we'll just do data and we'll pass in the actual data. So we're actually gonna run into an error right here and I wanna show you the error before we fix it. So inside of use effect on the first load of this component, when we first go to our website, we want to call this method, get the notes, update our state, and then we want to render it out down here eventually. So we're gonna get an issue right now. And I see a question, is React Django a good match? Absolutely, it's my favorite. Uh, absolutely love it. React is an awesome front end. It's one of the best, uh, but Django is a great back end, and it also does really well for building out APIs. So let's go ahead and see this issue. So if we go to our React app here, let's go ahead and refresh that. 
and let's see what's going on here. So if I try to open up my console here, let's see, we are returning an issue inside of the promise. Is that because the fetch failed? Let's see. Okay, we're going to that path. We're going to API. Then we get the response dot JSON. I think that should be fine. So what we should be dealing with right now is actually an error called cores, which stands for cross origin resource sharing. And I'm just not sure if this error is coming from that cores error right now. Looks like it's something else. Let's see if anyone sees the error, let me know. Yeah, we'll fix cores and I'll explain to you why we need to fix it too and how this works. Okay, so uh, we have the arrow function. Oh, wait, no, that doesn't look right. Give me one second. Let me check my notes here. I see someone saying Laravel is best. Yeah, it's all, also a really good framework. I think it's probably the most popular for PHP. I'm a pretty agnostic when it comes to frameworks like that. I tend not to go with one or another. I just like Python and I think Django is awesome and it builds out APIs. I know it's not as popular as far as a stack on YouTube and how people use it, uh, but it works great and I like to advocate for it. Okay, so let's see. What the heck am I doing wrong here? Call the async method. We have the function. We use await, we get the data, await the response. All right, so sorry about the delay here. It's gonna take me a second to figure out what's going on. So it's saying it's in the response. Okay, so yeah, we'll check the network tab. I see Shuvel saying that. Hold on, this thing keeps going up a little bit too fast. Okay, so here we go. All right, so it was the cores error. Perfect. I guess the, that's a good thing to run into and show you that fix. So these cores errors, um, it's gonna look something like this right here. And I'll just Google it up too, so to show you a more common uh, I guess look of the issue. So we're running into this error. We'll try it one more time. So we're seeing this right here. If I hover over it, it's in red. And we see this cores error, cross origin resource sharing error. So what's happening is, uh, here, let me just look it up another way. So we'll just do cores error. I'll just Google image it. So typically it would look like this in your browser and that's why it was hard to find. So it looks like this access to fetch. So basically it's blocking it and it says no access to control origin header. So what's happening here is we are running our application on two different ports. So react is on port 3000 Django is on port 8000. And if you built this inside of your Django application, this issue technically wouldn't occur. But what's happening is react is trying to make a request to Django and Django is saying, Hey, I don't know who you are and it's blocking it. It's saying we don't have any permission to allow anybody other than our own server to call these endpoints. So don't don't go here. You're not allowed to come here. So it's blocking it and that's it. So our React application is trying to make a phone call in a sense to get some data and Django is saying no. So there is a package to take care of this. And what we're going to do is we can actually specify a list of URLs that are allowed to call our API, or we can just say allow all URLs to call our API or uh, don't allow any. So by default, it's set to not allow any. So let's just go ahead and look up Django cores headers. And this is a package that we can install and actually use to fix this issue. So that's why I wanted to make that request run into the issue issue first, and then we'll fix it. So we'll scroll down here. So uh, this is inside of a GitHub link. I know they also have a uh, an entire page on this or some documentation on it. Uh, it was kind of hard to find it as of late. I'll link this up in the video description. Um, I'll also add it in the chat. So we'll throw that in there. And that is all in the chat now. Okay, so 
here we go. Cores is going to allow us to fix that issue. So the first thing we want to do is run this pip install. So we'll do pip install Django cores headers. Sorry about that delay. I know that's where streams are annoying because then anybody rewatching it has to watch that error. So at this point, I'm going to leave my server on, but I'm going to open up the other terminal. And this is the Django terminal. Now this is not the react one. So pay attention to what project you're in. We're working in two separate projects. And we're just going to paste that in. So Python dash M pip install Django dash cores dash headers, run that install. And that's going to get that prepped for you. Now in the documentation, it's also linked in the chat here. The next step is to add cores headers to installed apps inside of settings.py. So we'll bring that in. We'll go into our Django app and we'll go into settings.py and we'll just add that underneath rest framework. So cores headers as one word. Now the next part is, we set up the installation of that. We need to add the middleware, almost forgot about that. So we'll add that, copy this section only, not the bottom one. And back in settings.py, we'll go to middleware and we're just gonna add that right here. So just underneath our security middleware, we'll add a course header, make sure you add in the quotes and the comma, and we'll just do the last step here. So we have a few different options. The first one is to uh, allow all. So here are the three options, cores, origin, cores, allowed origins. So this is going to be a list that we can provide of all the endpoints that are allowed to call their API. So that would look something like this. We can say, these are all the URLs that are allowed to have access to our API. And this is a good way to do things. Now we can also add in rejects to this or regects, however you want to say it. We can also allow all origins. So cores allow all origins and that's a Boolean value. So true or false. And this is what I'm going to use right now, but I'd recommend if you have, um, if you're not trying to share your app and you have a specific URL that you want to allow, use this method right here and then just add in port 3000. Then when you deploy your site, add in that URL. So in my case, I'm just going to do cores allow all origins. And we're just going to put that in settings.py. And I'm just going to put that at the bottom of my page here. So at the bottom of settings.py, we're just going to allow all cores, allow all origins. So we'll save that. And then if I run this again, let me try this one more time. If I go to my react app, let me close out the Django rest framework, we'll close out the admin panel and we'll leave the notes open. So if I refresh this and if I go into inspect, let's see if we have that error. So now we don't have that error. So I consoled out my response and here we go. We see that array. And now I officially got my data from the backend into my react app. So we console that out and we updated our state. So now let's actually render that out inside of our notes. So in this case, what I'm going to do here is just uh, continue building this out. So we consoled it, we set our notes. So this state right here that we can access by the value of notes is now full of that data. So we'll create another div here and I'm just going to call this notes list or we'll give it a class here because we are going to style this in a second. So we'll do class name and this will be notes dash list. So in here, this is JSX code. We talked about this in the last stream that's linked up in the video description. Now we can do notes dot map and we're just going to loop through all of our notes and I'm going to add in another uh, parentheses there. So we're going to do note. So the actual note object and the current index. Then outside of that, we're going to add in the arrow function and we're going to output every single note. So we'll just do an H3 tag and we'll just do note dot body. So if I save that in the last video, we use the JSON server to replicate this, but now we have a real backend. So this is going to be pretty neat here. So we made the call. We call that inside of use effect, updated our state, and we rendered the data out. So let's take a look at this. So looks like I have an error. We'll fix that in a second, but now we can see this API data inside of our notes. So pretty cool there. We're actually calling that and outputting this. So this issue here, we talked about this in the stream, each, uh, each um, component here needs a prop called key. And we talk about props and state. We won't cover too much of that. But at this point, we just pass in the index, which starts at zero and every single item in the virtual DOM needs this key prop if it's inside of a list. So if I refresh that and then actually refresh the browser, now that error goes away and we have our data. So let's go to a single note right now. Actually, let's make this into a list item. So in the last stream, I made 
the list item its own component and we want to do that here too so this is where we start nesting components we'll go into components and we'll just do list item list item dot js then we'll use a shortcut react arrow function component exported and what we're going to do is destructure the prop that we're going to pass into it so if this isn't making sense watch that last stream we're going to pass in the current note and we're just going to output the note right here in an h3 tag and that's going to be note dot body so we have this component we need to bring this component into our notes list page so we'll do imp for the shortcut we're going into components so we'll do two dots and then components and list item all right so list item this is going to be a little bit redundant from the last stream if you watch that but we're going a lot faster and instead of rendering out like this we're just going to go ahead and do list item forward slash and we're going to pass in first of all the key prop which we need so index and then we're going to pass in the note so on each iteration we get the note object we set that prop and we pass it in it's like passing down a function parameter so we can pass down an object to the list item component which is right here we destructure that object and we render that out right here and this is going to be a big advantage to do this in our components like this later on um, as far as the ui you're not really going to see a difference but now it's outside in that prop there so let's go ahead and continue with our detail now so we want to get some more data so we want to add in some pages so at this point we're going to go into the documentation for react router dom and this is how we add in routing to our react application so we run this install so let's go ahead and run that installation in our react application i'm going to open up another terminal paste that in so npm install react dash router dash dom and we'll get that set up so we're going to create a page for a note here okay so while that's happening that's going to take a second we're going to create a proxy url so at this point inside of our notes list page we're specifying the entire domain here now i want to do something like this where i just specify that endpoint right there so i just do forward slash api and notes and then i just want to call the data without having to specify the entire uh, url path because if i push this live we're going to have an issue because now when we're live we're not going to be calling port 8000 we're going to be calling a real domain so if i save this in theory it should work but we're going to have an issue here so that react router dom just installed we'll take care of that in a second so if i refresh this we're getting an issue and the reason why this is happening is because if i go into my network tab i guess i'll show it to you first so we'll go into network refresh that and let's find the error can't seem to find it okay so basically what's happening here i'll just explain it is we're on port 3000 so when we do forward slash and leave it like that this call is going to port 3000 api and then nodes but we don't want it to go to port 3000 our api is on port 8000 so a different url so what we can do is we can actually go into package.json and we can specify a proxy URL. So let's just go ahead and add proxy. And then we're gonna specify the actual port number. So go ahead and write that in quotes. Then let's go ahead and go into our Django application. Let's copy that and let's paste that in here. So we won't have the closing forward slash, but now it knows that this is one of the URLs that we can work with. So when we do forward slash and then whatever route that we add, it's going to port 8,000. Now, in order for this to work, make sure your server is off. So turn it off and then restart it. And that's going to have to update. So we just added that proxy URL. So if I refresh it, once that's on, give that a second to open. And there we go. So now we're able to just do forward slash. All right. So our router is installed. So I just wanted to fix that proxy URL first. That's all we had to do inside of package.json. And now we can just do API for slash notes. So the React router is installed and we'll go back to the documentation to continue this process. So I'm going to import this into app.js. So we're going to import browser router and then we're going to import all these other options and remove a few of those. So we'll bring those in into app.js i'll close out all the other components it's starting to get messy here and let's go at the very top actually 
And let's get rid of link. That's going to replicate the React version of the A tag in HTML. Then let's get rid of switch. I'm not going to use that right now. And we just want router, which is the browser router. And then we want route. Okay, so in order to add in some pages now, we need to wrap our root component inside of a router. So we'll just do router like that. And we'll just bring in the closing tag around it. So we're wrapping all the components because we only had one page at this point. Now, in order to actually work with pages, we need to change this component right here to a route. So we use the router and then we have a route. So we specify a route. And then what we can do is specify the path for this route. So this is going to be the home page. We'll add in the forward slash. We'll add in exact. And I talk about this in the previous tutorial. So if you're not familiar with it, check that out. And then we add in the component that we want to render whenever the URL route matches that. So we'll just do notes list page. All right. So now we have a page. So if I go back here, we're not going to see a difference. So if I refresh it, we still see the page because that's the home page. But if I go to another route, now we're not going to see it. And we're only seeing that header. Now the header is going to appear on every page because that component is just imported into our main project. So now let's create a single note page. So to actually view a note. So we'll go into components or pages. We'll go to new file note page here. Dot JS. And let's go ahead and use a shortcut react arrow function component exported. All right, so that's a regular function. I want to use an arrow function. So react arrow function component exported. And let's continue here. So we'll just do h1. And then we'll just do a single note. All right. So we have the single note. We'll bring that into our page here. So we'll do IMP. We'll go into pages, note page, and then note page. Okay. So for this, we're going to specify another route. So we're just going to do route. And we're going into path. We're specifying the path here. So the path is going to be going to note forward slash and then the dynamic parameter is going to be ID. So kind of like what we did in Django where we pass in the ID and we use this value to actually uh, get certain data and query the database. We're going to pass in that ID that can change all the time. And then we need to specify the component. Now we don't need to specify the exact parameter like we did before. I talked about that in the last stream and that is because this path right here, if we just go to forward slash and then we try to go to this page, if we don't specify exact, this component will render because this path technically is going to be true every single time. So we say only render this component when this path is exact. So we just make sure that there's no conflict there. And this needs to be note page. Okay, so with our URLs, now I can go to note and then pass in the ID of one that should give us our note page. Let's see, I'll save that. For some reason, it's not showing up. Okay, give me a second. Did I not output any content with that? Let's go to our note page. So we have single note, we export it. And let's see, we'll go back to app.js. We import from pages, note page, specify the route, the component and the path. What am I doing wrong here? I might try to do a hard refresh. Maybe let's see if I just go to note, it's also not going to work. First note, second note. Give me one second. If anyone sees what I'm doing wrong, let me know. Pass in the prop to the note page. Well, at this point, it should just output some text. I just want to make sure that it's working. That's why I always test them. I'm not sure if that's the issue. Note page dot JS. So that looks good. Let's just try to restart the server. Sometimes you just have to do that and it'll work. So we'll see. Okay, so it's opening up in a new tab. Note and then one. 
Gosh, that's annoying. Here, let's just try removing the prop. Let's, uh, or this parameter right here. We'll get rid of that. And we'll just see if note works. Maybe it's supposed to be, oh, I found it. We're supposed to start it with a forward slash. That's why, dang it. Okay. So now if I go to note, we see, we see single note. If I go to note with the parameter F2. So this parameter right here is dynamic, just like when we query a note object here. Okay, so we have that single note. And now what we want to do is actually get that note data from that page and actually access this. So with our router, we are able to get a prop that was added to our uh, components here. And in this case, one of those props is going to be something called match. It's also in that stream. I'm going to keep referring to it so I don't spend time on this for the people that already know this or watch that stream. So we have the match parameter. And in this case, we want to get the note ID. Well, what did I click here? I think I opened up a completely new VS Code project. Okay, so we want to get the note ID here. So we're going to camel case that. So we're going into match.props or match.params. Let me double check this. So we're going to match.params. So we're getting the IDs or parameters. And then we need to go into the ID. So whatever we called it right here, in this case, we called it ID. So whatever we named that, we can access this. So that's going to give us our no ID. So now that we have that, let's just add that out here just to see that. So we'll just do no ID just to make sure. We'll just go to note one, we'll just change that up. So whatever this parameter is, I can even call it pizza like that. And there we go. So all these items are going to be output. So at this point, we just want an ID. So Let's go ahead and actually get that specific note. So in this case, we're going to use use state and use effect. So we'll do use state, use effect. I'll try watching the chat as much as possible. So if anybody has questions related to this, let's uh, go ahead. Um, I see somebody's asking, is the backend DRF? Yes. So we built it in Django and then use the Django REST framework to, uh, to work with the API to build that out. So we'll do use effect create the function, add in the arrow function inside of it. And we also want to set our state. So we'll do let note, and then we'll just do set note. So the getter and setter, or I guess just a setter. I don't know if it's called a getter. So the value and then the setter. So set note should encode and type. And then we're going to do use state. And in this case, what we're going to do for the object here is we're going to set that to null. So by default, until we load in an object, this value will be null. So let's go ahead and add in the function. So we actually want to get the note. So we'll just do get note. This is going to call the database. This will be an async function. And we need to set the value here. So equals to create the arrow function. And let's continue. So we're going to use fetch here. So we'll do fetch. Let's take in this parameter here. So we'll go into our API. And in this case, we want to get a single note. So remember, we go to API forward slash notes and then the ID. And now we don't need the port 8000 because we set up that proxy URL. So in backticks here, so we're going to use template literals. So in this case, we're not using, uh, we're not using quotes, we're doing backticks. And that's going to allow us to pass in dynamic parameters here. So we can do the dollar symbol and actually pass in a variable. So in this case, we'll just pass in the note ID. So we're getting the note ID from the URL, and then we're making the request. We will be doing authentication, Edward. So we'll get to that part. See the comment. Okay, so we're making that call. And this is going to be response here. So we'll do response. We'll set that value and that's going to be a wait. And then we'll get the data. So we'll parse it, we'll just do data. And that's going to be a wait. And we'll just do response dot JSON. All right. So then we're going to take that note, the set note value. I'm going to pass that in right here and we're going to throw in data. Okay. So in order to actually pass in the note, what I'm going to do is just add in a paragraph tag and we're just going to do note body. Eventually this will be a text field so we can update it, but we'll do note dash body and we're going to get an error until that note loads. So what we can do is actually pass in the question mark like that. And that's just going to avoid from throwing an error. So it basically says if we have a note body, then pass one in. If we don't, don't do anything. So just go ahead and ignore it. How do I set the proxy URL that was inside of package.json? Go ahead and add that in like that. So proxy, so proxy, and then the actual URL, make sure to turn off your server and then start it back up. 
if you don't do that, it won't work right away. So we have that, we pass in notes and we get the data, we set notes, and then we wanna call this from use effect. Now inside of use effect, I'm gonna add in the array for the dependencies. If I don't, I believe it's gonna spin that into an infinite loop. And we just wanna pass in the note ID for the dependencies. We talked about that in the crash course. Okay, so let's go ahead and try this. So we'll go to the note page. If we go to two, we're getting the data and we're passing that in. So what I wanna do is link this up from this page here. So instead of using the A tag, like a typical link from our notes list, we're gonna work with the React router DOM. So we're gonna go ahead and make an import here from react-router-dom and we're gonna import link. So it's very similar to the A tag and HTML, except for we're doing two instead of href. So we're gonna wrap our link not inside of the notes list page. We're gonna remove that. We're gonna do that from the list item component. So we're gonna import that and then let's change this div to list or to link. And auto rename tag, auto renames the closing tag here. So we'll specify that to two. And then for the parameter, we're just gonna go ahead and do the back ticks here. We'll do forward slash note and then the note ID, note.id. So it's gonna link it up and Let's check it out. So now if I click on one of these, we can see the note, we're calling the database and we're getting everything that we need. So uh, let's see, I think the next step is to style this. So at this point, it's gonna be a little bit repetitive. I'm gonna go pretty fast through the styling. If you wanna watch the styling from the last video where I do go a bit slower, I'll try to go as slow as possible here, but even though uh, we're still gonna be just copying and pasting, it's still gonna be decently slow, I guess. But if you wanna watch that one, I think I explained it a little bit more. So let's go ahead and work with this. Let's talk about styling. So inside of the GitHub repo, we are gonna get the styling from the front end folder and we're gonna go into source and in source, you should see a file called app.css. Go ahead and just grab all this styling here. There is a dark theme and a light theme. Go ahead and grab all the styling and let's just paste it in. So this is, uh, I guess, the least important part of this tutorial. We're just styling it now, um, but it also is pretty important because how something looks makes a big impact on how it's gonna be used and perceived. So here's all the code here. We're styling the note, the notes list. We have buttons here that we're styling and the entire body styling along with themes. I might deploy it, I'm not sure. We, uh, we'll see how, the, how we are on time. We're at an hour and 32 minutes and we're getting close. So we're still decently good. I wanna make sure this lasts maybe two, two and a half hours. So if we have time, we will deploy it. And if I do deploy it, I wanna do two options. I wanna deploy uh, the API to Heroku and then uh, the front end probably to Netlify. And then I also wanna deploy React to Heroku also. And I talked about that in the opening part, but there's different ways that we can do this. So we copied and pasted the styling and the styling is imported already into our app.js component or index.js, I believe. So it's already imported. So that means that all the styling will apply to all the components. So if I go to my application, let's go in here. We're going to see the styling change a little bit. It looks like the font is applying. Some of the padding and spacing is actually being applied. So we're actually going to start building out the HTML portion so the styles actually apply. All right, so let's go ahead and get, get into that. So we're gonna start with our app component. We're gonna go pretty quick here. So in app.js, I'm also gonna look up my notes here. So in app.js, we're gonna start with a container. So we're gonna change this to container. We'll wrap that. Then that div right there is also going to be wrapped inside of a class or inside of a div called class or called app. So we're going to go ahead and open and close that div. Copy and paste that and paste that down here. So we're wrapping the container and then another div. And this one is going to have the class of app. So what that's going to do here is it's gonna automatically style my app like this. Now we do have a dark theme. I took a, or I did a poll on YouTube and I think out of like two and a half thousand votes, everybody voted for dark mode. So let's switch it to dark mode. And that is done by these variables right here. So we have variables for the root application and then 
all the dark theme settings. So to apply this, we're just going to our container and we're just going to do dark. So if I save that, our app's going to look like this. So it looks a little bit not better, I guess, but in preference, whoever likes dark theme will like this one better. So now let's go into our notes here. So let's style these list items and everything that we have in here. How's everyone doing, by the way? If you want to say hi in the chat, I'm, uh, I'm watching it right now. So this is a slower part. So say hello if you're here. I think it's Vonch Rana. Thanks for saying hi. I see you in the chat. All right. So for the notes list page, let's wrap the entire page with a class name of notes here. Then we are going to create a header. So we'll create the header. We'll create the div. And this is going to be notes header. So notes dash header. And we want to create the title here. So we'll just do, I see Z, Yusuf. Is that Enrique? It starts with an H. I wanna, maybe I'm just, there's a silent H. I'm not sure. But thanks for saying hi, Mathis, Sharir. Some of these names are harder to pronounce. So sorry if I butcher them. Uh, Utshab and then Jabstein David. I think that's the right way to say it. Okay, let's see. I'm going to answer this question. So quick question. I saw the title about the Django, about Django. Where, where is the Django files? So that is, uh, we did that earlier. We're connecting those two right now. We'll, uh, we'll get to that. Right now we are building out two different applications. I have two different text editors open. So two different apps and they're in two different files. All right. Thanks for saying hi, everyone. I appreciate it. It makes me feel like I'm uh, not alone. I see 131 people are watching it. So I know someone's there. All right. So inside of our header, what we're going to do is output uh, just an icon with the title and then uh, just the note count. So let's go ahead and do this inside of the header. And that's not supposed to be a div. That's supposed to be uh, an H2 tag. Thanks for saying hi, everyone. All right. So this H2 tag is going to be a title. So in this case, it's going to be just a, like a hex code. So we'll just do the and symbol pound symbol and it's going to give us a cool icon and then nine seven eight two and like that so if i save that this is what it looks like so it's just this icon right here it looks kind of cool so uh, we'll just go ahead and give this a class name and that is going to be notes dash title and if i add in the class name of notes title it's going to make it orange because of the css file and then we also want to add in the count. So in this case, that's going to be inside of a paragraph tag with the class name of notes dash count. And then the note count here, which I can use the curly braces for, and I can just do notes dot length. So I'm just getting the length of that list and that'll tell me all the notes that we have. So as we keep adding uh, right now, we see the count is two, but as we add to it, that will keep updating and it'll keep the current count. Someone's asking if I remember the code. Um, yeah, for the most part, if I'm doing this alone, it's really easy to do it. But during the streams, I do have uh, like a preparation file that I reference. So it's not that hard once you've prepped it. It's pretty basic stuff. So the tougher applications would be more difficult. Okay, so we have that icon and I see Shuvo, my designer, who hates when I ruin his designs. He's <laughs> telling me to add in the notes title. He's right. Sorry, Shuvo. You work hard on these. I want to make sure they look good. So we added that in. We have the header and let's update the list items here. So we have the notes list. We already put in that class. The next styling goes into the list item component. So the actual items that are being output right here, these, these things right here, I almost said that like an Irishman, these things. <laughs> okay. So that's for me talking too much. All right. So the note component or the list item component. Let's see, what do we need to do here? So in this case, we're just going to the link here and in the link, we're going to create a div. So we're going to wrap this div. Let's create the space there. We'll just add in the title into the div. And let's see class name. And this is going to be notes dash list dash item. 
And that's it for now. So we're gonna style this later where we have the timestamps and so on. But at this point, we just added in the styling to create the spacing, the border bottom right there, and that hover effect. So that looks a little bit better. It's gonna look a lot nicer when we add in the styling. All right, so let's see. Now we need to go to the actual note page. So we're just outputting a paragraph tag. In this, uh, in this case, it's gonna be a text area. So we'll go to the note page. I see Ujual's in the chat. He's worked with me before. Good, uh, good developer. So we're uh, we're dealing with the back end part, which well, I'm I promise you, we're not just redoing the same application without modifications. Uh, we just have to do this part because I like to do it from scratch, just in case anyone didn't see the last one. So, all right, uh, the note page. Let's see. In this section, we're just going to add in the text area. So let's add in a wrapper. We'll just call this note, or give it the class name. Then we're gonna add in a text area instead of the P tags, so we'll do text area. And for the value, instead of just adding value, because I had this issue last time, we're gonna do default value. I think that's gonna work better, so we'll just do default value, and then we'll throw in this note body into that default value. So that should work with it and not mess with our state as much. So I can still do stuff like this, but we're actually gonna allow that to update the state. So this is inside of a text area, so now we can actually modify the note. It won't actually save, but we're gonna, let's see, how do you handle handle click? Sorry, I just wanna address this one right here. So how do you handle the click? I saw where you clicked on the note to pull it up, but I don't see the on click event. That's because of the link that we added. So inside of the list item, we add in the link from React Router DOM. So we don't have to handle click, the link will take care of that for us. All right, so inside of the note page, we wrap that. I also want to add in a header. So we're almost done with the styling, I promise. Sorry about the repetitiveness. Um, let's see, inside of the note, we do need a note header. We'll create a div here. This will be note-header. And at this point, I just wanna add in an icon here. So that's gonna be in the source code. So if you go to the code here, uh, inside of, the front end folder inside of assets. So source and then in assets, there's gonna be these icons here. And right now we want this arrow left icon. It's gonna be like a back icon. Uh, for some reason, it's kind of hard to see them. So I promise they're there. Go ahead and download those. Or you could just go to mumbleui.com and then just do arrow and then just get this one right here. So the one with uh, no line with it. So this left icon, download the SVG file and drag that into your project. So inside of source, we're gonna create a new folder called assets and we're gonna bring this icon in there. So we'll just grab that. That's going into the assets folder and I'm just gonna call that arrow dash left. Dot SVG. Okay, so instead of just dragging in the SVG file, let's go ahead and import the arrow left icon as a component. So inside of the note page, let's see, I'm like messing up all my files here. Okay, so let's go into the note component or the note page and bring that in. So it's up here, so we're just gonna import and that's gonna be a destructured one. We're going into assets and then we're going into arrow dash left dot S V G. And then we're just going to do react component as component as, and then we're just going to do arrow left. So we import this icon and then we can treat it like a react component. We name it. So in this case, I can use this as a typical react component and I can bring that in here. So if I save that, let's take a look. So we see that right there, it's not colored and that's because we're not done with the styling around it. So what I'm gonna do here is add in a link and a wrapper around this. So we'll just do H3, close that off. We'll throw in the arrow left component into the H3 tag, that's gonna give it some styling. And then I also wanna add in a link around it, which I'll need to import. I don't think it's imported yet. So we'll grab that link and then we'll wrap the arrow left icon. 
Someone's saying I could have used React icons. Yeah, I mean, there's a ton of options. This is just the way that we designed it with Shuvo. So uh, at this point, when someone clicks on that, we want to send them back. So that's what we're going to do. We're pointing them to that and let's take a look. Oh, link is not defined. I forgot to import that. Okay, so we're going to go in here and we're just going to do import from React dash router dash DOM and we'll import link. So we want to be able to use that. All right, so if I go back, I can go to the notes and continue back. So the styling is almost done. I think we have one last section and that is the header component. So we'll just fix that up really quick and that's gonna be easy. We'll just go back to the header and we'll just do note list. And then I wanna give this a class and this will just be app-header. All right. Looking a lot better. We have our header and the actual items. All right. So um, someone's saying if you want Emmet to work, you can just change the language and type language type from JS to JavaScript React. I don't use Emmet. I should, but in tutorials, I'm using shortcuts right now. And because I do a lot of tutorials, I tend to want to write things out by hand because I don't like skipping around. So for anybody that's newer, I feel like it's easier for them to follow. Okay. So Thank you, Simon. Saying, Dennis, awesome work. You make a simple mind map mapping app. Uh, that'd be fun to do. We'll get into more complex stuff with React for sure. I'm trying to change my content up to React a little bit. Okay, so we have this. Where are we now? So at this point, we styled our component. I know that took 15, was at 15, 20 minutes to style it. It's not important for this tutorial, but I wanted it to look good. Now let's continue with the back end. So for whoever asked how this works, we do have a back end right here. This is our API that we built out and we want to continue with this. So the next thing I want to do is actually deal with updating a component. So Praveen is saying make the front end live. I'll probably just do that during this tutorial because I don't want to skip around to that. So we need a route to actually update our components. So let's go ahead and create the back end path. So let's go back to our Django project and we will close everything out at first. So inside of our views, we have get notes and we have get note. So for a single note object. Now let's continue with that. And for this, we're just going to call this one update note. So we're going to create another view and we'll just do update note, pass in request. We do want to know which note we are updating. So we'll pass in the primary key. And we also want to make this uh, view for the Django REST framework. And inside of this list of the methods that we want to allow, we're going to use or take in a put request. So the only request this route can take is a put request. Post is usually for creating items, whereas put is for uh, updating items. So it's for partial updates of an object. Okay, so for the response, what I want to do is, uh, I guess we don't really have to do too much for the response, we could just return back the object. Uh, in this case, Let's just do return. Oh, that's lowercase. So return and then response. Uh, let's just return the object. We'll just do that. We might as well. So in this case, I'm just going to take, um, we'll just do serializer.data when we actually do it. So serializer.data and we'll make that a lowercase s. And we need to get the note first. So I know we're a little bit ahead of ourselves. So let's actually process this. So when we're sending our request, we're going to send it in the body. Sorry for hitting that. Uh, we're going to send our request in the body with our fetch call. So in that case, we're going to get the data and we can get that with request.data. This is something that we have access to with the Django REST framework. If you weren't using the Django REST framework, you'd probably do request.body or request.post and then get whatever data was in there. So in this case, we're just going to do request.data and it's going to give us that JSON file. It's already JSON data, so we don't have to parse it. Now we're going to get that data and then we need to continue processing this. So we also want to get the note. So let's see, I'm trying to think about how I want to do this. So we got the data, then we're going to get the note. So we'll just do note and it's going to be note.objects.get and we're going to get it by the ID. So we want to know which note are we going to update. So we get the note. And then we want to get the serializer. So serializer, keep hitting enter and it gives me the capital S. So we're getting the serializer, we're passing that into the note serializer. 
we're going to pass in the note that we got and then we're going to set many to false. So we're getting back a single object. Okay, and then we want to go ahead and actually process that. So what we can do with this serializer is we can actually just do if serializer dot is underscore valid, then we can actually save that. So we'll just do serializer dot save. Okay, so let's talk about what's happening here. So if you are if you are familiar with model forms, we can simply pass in data into our serializer and call the save method and is valid just like you would on a typical model form. So it's processing that data and we can just run save on it. Now we could do all of this manually, but the serializer really uh, makes things faster for us. So we might as well use it. So we're throwing in the new values into that serializer and then we're saving them. So for the serializer, now there are a few things that we need to do here. So what we need to do actually is pass in the instance of the note. So I actually messed this up here. So we'll just do instance. So we're basically saying we're getting the instance of the note because we want to know which note to update. And then we need to specify data. And the data is going to be the data that we got from the front end. Here we go. So sorry about that. I forgot that. So we're getting the data. We're getting the note. We're using the serializer. We're passing in the instance of the note. So we're serializing that particular note. Then we're passing in the new data into that note. So it's going to update it. Then we save it. So whatever new data we send in, it's going to save it. So we have the backend portion almost done. We have the view and we have the URL that we want to continue with. So for the URL here, let's see, we're just going to do notes. So we'll just take this route here. We'll do notes, the ID, and we will just do update like that. Now the issue with the way that I'm doing things is that this route right here needs to be put at the bottom. So we'll just get the single note from the very bottom and then we'll probably fix this up towards the end. So we're taking the notes parameter, we're passing in the ID and we're saying we want to update the note and we're going to take update note and paste that in for the view and we'll just do update dash note. Okay, so if I try to access this from the API here, this is what it's, this is what's going to happen here. So it's just saying that this get method is not allowed and it's going to tell us that we need to pass in a put method. So if I were to pass in some content here, like a JSON object, we would actually update the note based on that content passed in. So we'd have to send that put request. So we want to do this from the front end and not from here. So let's go back to our react application now. So at this point we have an endpoint. We have the URL. So the URL is notes ID and then update that sends it to this view. We pass in that data and we modify it. Let's go to the front end here and we'll continue. So let's close out our header, close out our list item and we'll go into the note page. So let's see. The first thing I want to do is update the state when my note gets updated. So let's go in here into the text area and we'll just do on change. So we're going to submit the state, the actual state of our note. So we'll just do on change and we'll pass in a function here because we need to delay our function call. We'll use an arrow function and we're just going to do set note. So on each key up, as we're updating our text area, we want to update the note. And in this case, we're going to update the note object. So we're going to use the spread operator. We're saying that we want to update the note object and specifically we want to update the body of the note. And that's going to be E dot target dot value. Well, what the heck did I do there? Okay. E dot target dot value. So on key up, let me just show you what's going on here. As we update here, this is updating the state. So on every single change, we're calling that key up method or on change method and we're updating the state. Once that state is updated. So once we make our modifications, we want to send a call to the back end and actually update that note. So let's do that. So in here, let's see inside of our method here, we're going to call another method and we're going to call this update note. And let's see, we're going to wrap this inside of async here because there is going to be a fetch request being made here. We'll go ahead and make that fetch call. So this fetch call right here, we're going to use the back ticks and this needs to be sent to this route. So API notes ID and then update. So we'll throw that in there. Then we can pass in the variable. So we'll do note ID 
and I need to set equals right here. It's going to fix that. So we're making the call. And at this point, because we're sending data, we need to pass in some more things here. So we're going to set the method. And this is going to be a put request. So we'll just do put. Then we're going to pass in the headers. So we'll just do headers. This is going to be the type of content that we're sending. So this will be content dash type like that. And then we'll just do application forward slash JSON. So we're sending JSON data. We're sending a put request when this method is called. And after that, we do need to pass in a body. So body is going to be the data that we're sending with this. So this needs to be stringified. So we'll do JSON.stringify. So that's what we have to do with the fetch API. We have to stringify the data first. Then in here, we're just going to pass in the node. So in the last tutorial on the stream that we did on Monday, two days ago, we had to do something like this where we passed in the spread operator and the note, and then we had to pass in the date. So we knew when this note was updated. Now, in this case, we're just passing the note body. And I mentioned that we had to do that because we're using the JSON server, which wasn't a full backend. So we're just simply passing the object and we're not having to do the date because the date will be automatically updated on its own. So the backend will take care of that. So we actually don't have to deal with that right now. So it's a little bit nicer and cleaner to handle things that way. So we have our update note method and that's it. Now, when do we want to call this? So I want to call this whenever we click on the back link. So we're not going to have like a done button unless we're creating a note. So the note is supposed to be seamless in how we update it. So we click on it, make a change, hit back, and that should update it. So in this case, I need to add in an event handler on this arrow left button. And what I'm going to do is actually just get rid of that back link because we're not going to need it anymore. And we're going to create a method that handles that redirect process. So we're just going to do uh, let and then handle submit. So we want to handle each one of these clicks here and that's going to be an arrow function. And in this case, we're going to add in some logic here in a second, but at the, but right now all we want to do is update our note. So we're calling the update note method. We're going to pass in that note, send the request to the backend, and then we want to redirect a user. So because of that router, we also have access to something called history. Also talked about in the last tutorial. So we have history dot push and we're going to send the user back to the home page. So that's it. So we handle the click, we call the method and we send the user. So that's why we didn't need that link anymore. Now, I don't think that's going to affect styling, but let's just test it. And let's just see how all this works. So if I go ahead and make a change, if I hit back, we have an issue. Oh, I forgot to call it. So we're just going to do on click. Let's just pass in handle submit. Now that should do it. So let's refresh it and let's just say uh, updated right here. So we'll do updated. Let's hit back and there we go. So that's in the back end. Our API is now updated. So if I refresh this, uh, if I go to my notes list, we see this updated right here. So that sent the call. So as I make this call, if I look at my Python or my Python, my uh, Django server, I can actually see those requests being made. So if I go back here, minimize this, this is my Django server. So if I make that request, if I click on it and go back, we're seeing these calls be made. So for some reason, it's not showing up. I'll restart that. So we can see that that request is sending it. There we go. And every single update, we're updating it at that point. Perfect. So uh, let's do a little bit of ordering here. So if I click on a note and make a change, technically anytime I click on it and go back, it's going to update it. So what I'm going to do here is make sure that based on my model structure in the back end, uh, I just want to make sure that we are always ordering by the time that we updated our note. So in my phone, this app actually updates the note uh, just when I edit it and it automatically goes to the top. So my most recently edited note should be at the top. So we'll go to get notes and there's different ways of doing this. And in this case, I'm just going to order this query set right here. And we're just going to do ordering or order by, and we'll just say updated. So if I invert it, I believe that's going to invert it by ascending order. So if I go to second note and then go back, that's going to be at the top. If I go to this note and go back, it's just going to re reorder that. So I like that feature. It's going to give me the most recent note. If I go to a note that I added months ago and then happen to work on it, it should appear at the top. 
So now let's work on deleting a note. So we'll go back here and we're gonna create a delete note method. So before we can actually build that in the front end, we need to create that in the back end. So let's go down here and we're gonna create a view for that. And delete note will be pretty easy. So we're gonna create the view. We'll just say delete note, pass in request here. And let's see what I wanna do here. So I do wanna get the note by the primary key. I wanna make sure this is using the Django REST framework style to view. We'll take in the HTTP request of delete. So that's the type of method that we can take. And we'll just do return response. And that will just be note was deleted. So we'll just let the user know that the note was deleted and that's it. So for the actual value, we wanna get the note. So we'll just do note.objects.get get that value by the ID. So we'll get that value and then we'll just do note.delete and that's it. So delete will simply remove that object from the database. So now we have a backend, we need the view here. I see uh, Praveen and Shuvo talking in the chat and Ujwal, so I'm not following it too much, but it's hilarious watching you guys talk there. <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of hearts and laughs, so I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. So inside of our paths here, let's go ahead and copy update note. So we'll take update note, paste that in, and we're just gonna do notes, ID, and then delete. Then in here, we're just gonna do delete here, and then we'll just do delete note. All right, so we have the URL and we have the method and all we need to do is pass in delete. We don't even need to pass in an object at this point. So let's go to the front end now and let's handle this. So we'll go, we'll go back here and let's create or let's just um actually we'll create it from scratch at this point so let's just do let update note or delete note delete note and that's going to be an async method so we'll just do equals to async and we'll just do the arrow function continue that and we're, we're going to use the fetch api call too so fetch and the route that we're using, we're still gonna use the similar parameter here or the path, except for we're gonna pass in delete. So that's the route that we're going to. We just created that endpoint. And for the headers here, we need to pass in the method and that's gonna be delete. So that's the type of method. Then we'll just do headers. And let's see, we'll just do content type application json so i'll just copy and paste this right here go through this part faster now i don't think i need to send a body for a delete method i don't think i need to send it so that should be it and what i'm going to do here is take history.push and paste that just after my fetch call here so once fetch is complete let's see it ends right here so we'll put that just after that so i want to be able to take delete note and then actually have a button here so we're going to create a button and this is going to take in on click we're just going to do delete note like that so then we should delete the note send that request and redirect a user all right let's check this out let's go back here we'll go to a note here it should say delete why is that not showing up what do i do here oh i didn't add the value into the actual button so we'll just do delete like that I'm gonna turn off this fan. It's actually making my head cold. I have a fan above me. All right, so we have the delete button. It should trigger that delete method and then redirect a user. So if I go here, why is it lined up like that? Give me a second to fix that here. Oh, I think I was supposed to add that outside of this H3 tag. So the H3 tag was for some styling. So the delete note needs to be right here. Let's uh, try that again. We'll go to the note. Second note, if I click delete, there we go. So we sent the request to the back end. We removed the note from the database and the note was removed. And then we rendered out the new note. So we have the delete method. We have the update method. Now we need to create the create method. So for this, uh, in the last stream, we added a button here. So it's a floating button, just like you saw in the preview. We're going to add that in right now. So let's go ahead and do that. See 125 people in the stream. Am I boring anybody yet? No one's falling asleep. 
All right, so we need to add the button. So at this point, what I'm gonna do is add it as its own component. So we'll go into components and we'll just do add button dot js and we do this because it's going to have its own styling and uh, things that kind of go with it so we'll create it as its own component and that'll give us more customization options let me pull up some notes for that and let's make a few imports so the first thing is this button is going to have to link somewhere so we're going to have to make a link and this is going to be from react router dash dom we'll import the link Des <laughs> come on gary you're messing with me here just fell asleep. That's because you're a designer. How do you like my design, by the way? Let me know. It's not my design. It's actually Shuvo who works with me. This isn't the final version, but it's a notes app. So if you're feeling uh, tough today, go ahead and comment on it. All right. So we import the link. Uh, we also want to import an SVG file. In this case, we're going to go into Mumble UI and we're going to grab in the add button. So we'll just do add. We're taking this plus icon. It's also inside of the source code. So inside of that assets folder in the GitHub repo, go ahead and check out the add.svg file. It needs more co cowbell. All right, so we're gonna add that. I don't know what that means, cowbell buzz, like it needs to pop, like every designer loves to hear. So funny story, uh, Shuvo is actually working on a client project with me. I hired him for one. My, uh, one of the first projects that I take on in a while because I don't freelance anymore and the client asked us to make the design pop. So we had a good laugh about that because of Gary's tweet where designers hate dealing with that. But it's all going good though. <laughs> Saturday Night Live meme, oh, okay. All right, so we got that add icon. So it's right here and we're gonna import that as a component again. So we're just gonna do IMD and then uh, let's see, what am I going or where am I going? So I'm going into assets and I'm doing add.svg, import that as a React component. And then that's gonna be add icon. All right, so let's bring this icon in here. So we're just gonna drag that in here, add the link, we'll change the div to that link and we'll point the route here to note. And instead of passing in the ID, we're just gonna do new. So we'll throw in that and then that's how we're gonna decide whether we're creating, uh, creating a new object, uh, creating a new note or if we're updating one. So we're gonna be able to identify it by that. So we'll do add icon, bring that in right there. That needs to close with the forward slash. And there we go. By the way, Gary, I heard you hate JavaScript frameworks. I'm actually curious on why, because you have a video on Svelte. I was wondering how you like that and if that was actually true, because I thought I heard you say you hate them. I guess as a designer, I can see that. All right, so our note icon. I can bring that into my notes list page now. So let's import that. So we'll go into the assets folder. So we'll do, or not assets, but components. Add button, that's what it was. Okay, add button. Getting distracted trying to keep a conversation and code here. All right, so we have the add button. We just have a link and an icon. We bring that into our notes list page. We take this icon and we had to give it a class. So make sure you add that because that is styled and that's what's gonna make it like float inside of the notes list. And let's add that just underneath our notes list div. So now if we go back, if I close that out, let's see, we have an issue, assets, add SVG, it's not working. Did I import that wrong? Oh, that was supposed to be .svg. Okay, so that was the issue. All right, so here we go. We have the icon here. We click on it. We should be able to add a note. Now, a few conditional things here. When somebody is adding a note, I don't want them to be able to delete a note. That makes no sense. Uh, the note hasn't been created yet. So we're going to add a condition here. And that's gonna be inside of our note page. So we wanna go here and we wanna create the condition using the ternary operator. It's gonna give us a shortcut here. And we're just gonna say if note ID is not equal to new, so we'll just do new. So that's, that's gonna be the URL here. If it's not equal to new, then let's go ahead and add in the delete button. So we'll throw that in. 
Now, if that parameter is new, we can add in the colon here and we'll throw in a new button. So I just copied and pasted that and we'll work on the on delete method in a second. At this point, I want to prompt the user to just hit done. Now they can save the note just by going back, but I want to give them a more user friendly way of doing it because somebody might go to the website and they might not understand how to actually save this note. So if they go here, if they click back, they think the notes can be deleted. So we want to prompt them. So if I go to create a new note, if that URL parameter is new, we see done. If I go to a regular note, it's delete. So we have that, we just threw that in here and we wanna fix up another thing. So when we go to this page, what's happening is by default in this page or in this component, we are requesting a component. Let's see, Shuvo is saying, Dennis, beware of Gary. You code in Python, he owns the... <laughs> I hate snakes so bad, I can't believe he has them. I, I gag every time I see pictures of Gary's. Well, that, that, that just sounded bad. I don't see Gary snake. <laughs> that just sounded wrong. All right. So anyways, let's get serious. So we have an issue here. And the issue is that we are making a request. If I go to the network tab, if we go to the request of the endpoint of port 8,000. I guess 3000 at this point, why is it doing that? It's trying to make a request and it's trying to go to notes and then new. We don't have that endpoint right now. Now, what I'm gonna do here to fix that is I'm gonna stop this request from trying to get a new note if we are trying to create a note. So all we have to do is uh, create a condition here. So we'll just say if note ID is equal to new, then we're just gonna return and it's gonna stop this code from executing right here. So we're gonna stop that request from being made. So if I save that, that network issue should go away. So if I go here, let's check this out. Yeah, so that issue goes away in the console, that error also goes away. So now we did a little bit of cleanup, we fixed that button, we made sure that when we go to this page and we're not trying to edit a note, we're not requesting that data for a note. All right, so now we can actually work on adding the note itself. So let me just pull up my personal notes for this. So we're saying notes quite a bit. All right, so for the note to add it, we're just gonna take update note and I'm just gonna copy this. I'm gonna paste that and we're just gonna call this create note. And before I execute this, I actually wanna comment that out. So let me just finish something up here actually. I forgot one thing, on to handle submit, when a note gets completely removed. So for example, if we go here and a user, uh, they have two options to delete. They could hit the delete button or if they happen to remove all the content from a note like that, if they go back, that note should be automatically deleted. This is how that notes app works in my phone. So I want the note to delete then too. So when there are no notes here, so we'll fix that up. So we'll go into handle submit and let's just remove update note and let's create a condition. So we'll just go ahead and first check if the note ID is not equal to new. So if it's not equal to new, then, or and we have no note body. So the no note dot body. So if it's not a new note and there is no new, no new, wow, can't talk. No note body, there we go. Then what do, we, what do we wanna do here? Well, at this point, we could just trigger delete note because it's a note that exists, but it has no body, so go ahead and remove it. That means our user deleted stuff and the note was removed. Then we can just do else if, and at this point, we'll just say if the note ID is not equal to new, if the note ID is not equal to new, then let's just go ahead and update the note. So we just have a few conditions here and handle submit will take care of all this. If it's not new, update it. If it's not new and it has no body, delete it and that's it. Now let's go back here. So I'm gonna go back and re-edit this. So we changed the method name. Now we want to create a note. So we need to create the endpoint to actually build out a note. So let's see, we have update note, we have delete note and we wanna do create note at this point. So let's create a new view and I'm gonna create that above our update note view. So we'll just do at API underscore view. We'll start with this first, the decorator. We need a post request, create the method. We'll call this create note and we'll just do request. 
And let's see, how do I want to process this? So in this case, I think I could just pass in the entire body. So we'll just do return response and we're going to pass in that serializer. So uh, let's just go ahead and take in the data. So the data is going to be request dot data. So that's going to send the JSON data. Then we could just go ahead and do note and that's going to be equal to note. And there's different ways of doing it. I'm just going to do it this way now. So we'll just do note dot objects dot create. So we can just do create like that. And we're just going to specify the body and the other attributes are going to be created automatically. So updated and created will generate themselves. I don't need to send that data. So we're taking in the body. We'll just do data and we'll request the body from that. So once we pass that in, once that's sent in, we'll just use the serializer and we'll just do note serializer, we'll pass in the note. If for some reason we want to do something with this data in the front end, many is going to be set to false. We're returning back one single object. We need to set that value and then we'll just do serializer dot data. Okay. So that's create note. We take the data, we create the note, serialize it and return it. So for the actual URL here, we also want to render that. So let's go into the URLs and I'm going to put this just underneath notes right here. So we'll just create the new path. Okay. So Someone, someone's asking a good question here. So let's see, this is uh, how to use forms method post and get data. Well, we're not working with standard forms. This is the, I guess the beauty and the difference between react and using things like the Django rest framework is we're not working with the traditional forms and the post methods. In this case, we have like a whole different set of tools to work with. And it actually makes our life a lot easier when it comes to things like CSRF tokens. We're not having to send those and uh, different things like that. So that's why we're not using that because we're using the Django REST framework for this. So if you look at the front end, we're not even submitting a form technically. We actually just have a text area. There's no form wrapper around it. So we're using the fetch API to make this call. This is JavaScript to actually submit that. So if you just joined, um, I would recommend rewatching, kind of see how we set things up here, but it's a little bit different from a traditional application or how I traditionally build out Django applications and tutorials. So now we're just going to notes create. That's going to be how we make one. And we're just going to go ahead and do views dot create note. And the name will just be create dash note. All right. So I'll try to get to some questions a little bit later. So I just want to try to finish this up. So notes create, that's going to trigger the create note method. That's going to, fire this off and that looks good at this point. I don't think I'm missing anything. So let's go to the front end. Now in the front end, we have our create note method. We call that route at this point, we can get rid of that and we're just going to do create. So that's the end point. We're sending a post request now, not a put request, and we're just sending the note object and that's it. So we'll take create note and let's see. So, at this point, what I could do is just add in the submit button directly on this button. So we'll just do on click on the done button. Let's just actually here. I got a better idea. So let's do this. So let's write in the last statement. So we'll just do else if, and we'll let this method handle everything. I believe that's how we did it in uh, Monday's tutorial. So, or Monday stream. So we'll just let this handle everything. So else if the note ID, is equal to new. So if this is a new note, then let's go ahead and create it. So not only does it have to be a new note, but it also has to make sure that note is not empty. So we want to make sure that we actually have something there before we submit it. So if we have this, then let's go ahead and trigger create note. All right. So we trigger that method. So we have a delete update and create. So that means that I can now use handle submit here and that should take care of everything right here. So on click, let's just do handle submit and that should run through that logic, even though it's only supposed to create, but this should fix that. So I saw the question, um, says, Hey Dennis, I was watching your previous react video, followed it. But when I update the item or create a new one, it doesn't show on the homepage unless I reload it manually. Uh, I believe, it depends. It must be on how you're redirecting it. I see Shuvo here 
he's responded he said check the logic of the else statement so how is that redirecting it depends on that it should reload if the component's being re-rendered i'm not sure i'd have to see it it's kind of hard to understand exactly why but it seems like that that state method is not being triggered again so let's finish this up here so we'll start with the done method so we'll go in here and let's just do another note so if i hit done now that note was added so we triggered the last method and then we'll just do one two and so on and i can also update these updated all right so that looks good so if i go back the note was updated and oh i also added in this logic so i wanted to show you that so we have one updated let's get rid of two so instead of hitting delete if i get rid of that and go back two should be up or removed let's fix this okay so two is not being removed so if the note id is not equal to new and the note body doesn't exist let's get rid of it let's delete the note why is that not happening let's see we'll do triple equals right there because that should remove it technically there is no note body uh hmm let's try another note okay let me try doing a hard refresh shuvo if you see the issue let me know so dennis note body and empty on the last if statement okay so i'm guessing that's in the handle submit else if no body the last if statement works that's how i built it out originally now we could change it here let's try this let me just console out note All right, let's give this a shot. So we'll just go into note here, see which one's firing off. So it might not read it correctly. So we'll go to another note. We'll get rid of that. So we'll change it up, then go back. Note body is empty. Maybe I can put, it's weird because this worked before, but I could try doing an and hmm. so that's a little bit tricky i can't figure out why that's not the case i might have to get back to this in a second because i don't want it to delete or delay the stream here let's try this if uh and if a uh, note body note.body is not equal to an empty string because technically it should be an empty string actually if the note is not new it should exist so let's try this if i go to updated go back yeah that does delete it okay so now it's working um, i think that's going to be the better solution than to what i did the other day so uh, there we go that removes it so once i remove the content the it's going to be an empty string now inside of the state so when i hit back the delete method should trigger and that's good and we can also add new notes if we click like that and we can also go back and that will add the notes and then remove them okay so it's still not happening i'm going to get back to it in a little bit so uh note.body not equal to null that's what i thought i had before let's try this okay so note.body not equal to null because it's going to be an empty string that's the weird thing so let's try this method one more time i can't figure this out it's funny because it worked and this is how a lot of things happen it's kind of annoying but if uh it worked and then all of a sudden it changes so if note.body not equal to an empty string filter needs to be so rather so shuvo is saying hey dennis try if body is equal to oh if body is equal to not not equal to is that what i didn't do last time maybe i forgot that okay so if i refresh this now if i go back 
<laughs> All right, that's annoying. All right, on the last, I'll, this is exactly where I had the issue last time. So note ID is equal to new. Go ahead and create a note. If note ID is not equal to new, go ahead and update it. Let's see, is the delete method even being triggered? Let's just do that. So console.log, and maybe it's actually firing off, it's just not working, so delete. Okay, so let's check the console now. So if I do this, I see that the Okay, so it wasn't that conditional. So let's just try going here. So it's not even firing off. So it's this condition for sure. If no body is equal to an empty string. Yeah, all, all this code will be, so note.body. It should be a triple equal to though. It's not, I mean, let's try, let's try it like that. Let's just, it's usually safer to do the, all right. Um, I think I'm going to skip this and get back to it. That's really annoying. Note not equal to new. Yeah, because the idea is not new when I'm clicking that. All right, let's skip it and then we'll get back to this later. Uh, let's see, where do I need to continue? So we have the create method. That's all done on the last elf. Let's see. Okay, let me. it's going to bother me. I won't be able to continue. So on the last else if check the second statement if no id is equal to new and the note is not equal to null that seems right to me here let me just console out the note one more time so here's what's happening technically the note is supposed to be an empty string when i remove everything from it so if I go to two and I click back, when I console this out, if I look at the note, the body, oh, okay, so I'm seeing, I'm seeing an issue. So for some reason, it looks like the state is not updating. So now it removes it, but for some reason, when there's only one element, so check this out, if I do one, two, so if I save, Okay, so it looks like I'm gonna have to rework a few things here. So if I remove this one and I go back, or, or go all the way back, it should remove the element. But it's that key up method that's not working. So it's not, it's not, someone's saying it's the last else if statement. I, I keep seeing that, but I don't see why that's the issue. So let's try this. So if I just do one, the note is there, and then when I click remove, and I go back, so that, let's actually, uh, Let's add it, let's refresh it so I can see the fresh console. If I go back, the note body still remains. So it looks like the state is not being updated. Okay, so. It seems like this is being delayed. Note body. Everyone keeps saying this. Okay, let's let's see. Use instead of instead of note, use note body. But that's for the create note. Again, that's what's. Oh, okay. So for the create note, you're probably right. You actually did. That was another issue that I saw. But it's still on the delete method. So that's going to delete it. Look, if I add an A and go back, it's added. And then if I remove it, it won't remove it. So we fixed that. You're right with the note body thing. <laughs> Okay, so for some reason, my, it looks like my state is not updating right here. On set note, it looks like it like has like a delay in, in how it's updating the state. So check it out. If I have one letter there and I hit back, it's going to console out the note and the note still has A inside of it. The, the video won't be deleted. Unfortunately, it's starting to get really long because we're trying to fix this issue. I'll put in a timestamp that says we're working with this. So the problem is with the set note logic. Yeah, that's what I'm seeing. Okay, so uh, what I could do is just add in like a handle change function. 
So we have the note, so we have the spread operator and we update the note body. So it's updating, let's try this. Let's, uh, let's create another method. So we'll just do handle change. And it could be in the way that it's calling it. So in this case, we'll just take set note right here. Okay, so we'll pass in handle change. Okay, so handle change gets triggered and inside of handle change, we wanna pass in the event, I guess, or e dot target dot value because the update stays depending on the previous state. Okay, hold on, let me try to fix this issue and I'm gonna to get to the comment section. So handle change, we'll just do set note because we do have the value. I'm wondering if it's the default value issue. I, I get this comment right here. This one actually makes sense. I'm just trying to figure out how to logically put that into action. So let's just try this. And then if anything, we'll just leave this as a method and then uh, we'll fix it from there. So we'll just do value like that. So set note, that's going to be the value of the body. So in this case, we're going to set, we're going to use a spread operator. So the spread operator for the note, and we're just going to do body like that. If you can change on change to on change to handle change. Hmm. Then that should be the value. This should be the note body and let's trigger handle change. So let's see. All right, let's try this. Yeah, it's totally in how I'm, how I'm updating the state set and old Set note, note dot value. That's exactly how I had it. What am I? Set note. We have the note. We use this. Oh, okay. You're here. Sh Shivo, you want to hop on or let me know? Just here. I'm going to try that method that you just did. You just went to note and then. Oh, okay, hold on a second. I just wrote that completely wrong. Okay, so we have the arrow function. I completely missed the or lost the chat. Oh, here it is. Okay. Yeah, okay, so that's uh, set note, note, value. Oh, I, I did the spread operator again. Okay, so note. For some reason, it won't let me copy the chat message. Is that not how I'm doing it? So we have, we have the note, then we pass in, we use a spread operator, body dot value. Body should be in quotes, I believe. I don't think, yeah, I think that needs to be in quotes. I'll fix that if anything.
All right, Shuvo, if you want to get on voice chat with me, uh, let me know. You can. Uh... Yeah, it's it's so weird in how it's updating. I'm like reading all the comments because we do need to solve this for this right here. Like if I if I end the stream without this, I'm leaving out a big part. So on change, is that? Is this the is that the default value that's causing it? That shouldn't be the case. Okay, guys, I, I think it's a, I think it's a default value. Free beer. I guess I got that free beer. So it had something to do with the fact that I had the default value. Shuvo, let me know if you notice anything there. But I had it as default value. Now I set it as the value. And for some reason, when I deleted that last element, it wouldn't work. So before the issue wasn't this. So if I had a note like this, if I removed it, it would work just fine, right? So if I go back, the note is gone. If I had one item, let's say I have just a letter A. And if I go back, it wouldn't go away. So right now it does, but if I change it back to default value, and I'm not sure why that's the case. I just, that's the only thing I can see that was different from the last time that I made it or the last time I, that I did this. What's up, Danny? I see Danny Thompson in the chat. So right now, if I add in an A right there, right? And then if I go back here, remove it, it doesn't go away. But if I use that, if I change the default value, that fixes it. So we're gonna leave it at that for the stream because that is, way too much of a headache to deal with. It's in the way that it's updating the state and it's something to do with that default value. So now if I do that, remember, or if you look at it now, if I added that, if I add the A and remove it, it goes away. Okay, so current problem is resolved. Now, where the heck am I? Okay, so we have the create functionality. We finished all that up. We do have some methods that trim our data down. So we wanted to fix up this actual note. So let's take care of that. And uh, we'll do that pretty quick because I built out all these methods in the last stream. So I'm not really gonna explain too much. Uh, I was thinking about copying and pasting them, but I'll just write them out. So inside of our list items right here, we see the actual uh, note item here and we see something like this. So if I were to add another note, so we'll just say uh, today's agenda. So technically this is a note, so you can add in like different things. Uh, we'll just say walk dog code sleep or something like that. So I just want to add a few of them. So in the stream two days ago, what we did here is we trimmed this down. So we generated a title, even though our database only has a single body, we're going to generate a title, a timestamp and the actual uh, body to the code, but we're going to remove the title from the body. So you see right here, this looks pretty bad, especially if we did something like this, if we added a bunch, um, we're going to do this pretty quick, but if we added in this lorem ipsum text here, uh, let's just say we throw that in, put that in right here, add in a new line. Look at that. So the entire notes app is completely messed up. That looks horrendous, hard to see, and the entire content of the note is there. So we're just going to trim that down. And instead of just doing like a body trim here, what we're going to do is generate the title and then generate the body from the title. So that's going to be inside of the list item here. So this is where we're going to create these methods. Now, I guess I need to kind of regain some time after that 15 minutes of, uh, 15 minutes of messing up there. So let's go ahead and do that. The first thing I want to do here is generate the title. So we're going to create a, we're going to create a method outside of this list item method, and we're going to call this get title. So we'll create that. We're going to pass in the note, and we're going to go ahead and return the title value, which we are about to generate. So in this case, we need to create the arrow function. All right. So in this case, let's go ahead and generate a title. So this was done in the last stream. So if you really want to see the details of this, check that out. It's linked in the video description. That was Monday's stream. So we have our title and this is going to be note body dot split. And we're going to split this by the lines here. So what this is going to do is it's going to take all of these items right here in this JSON array that we generated that we got from our API. And it's going to take this new line and it's going to basically create a space and it's going to create a list out of this element, this element and this one right here. So it's just going to split them up. So we're going to create an array here. 
So we're first going to split them and then we want to get the first index of that array. So we want to get that title and that needs to be an N right there. Once we get that title, we're just going to go ahead and check a condition and we're just going to say if the title length, so title dot length, So if the title length is greater than 45, then let's go ahead and just trim it down. So we'll just go ahead and return that. So we'll just do return title dot slice and we'll just do index zero to 45. All right, so that's gonna get the title for us and we can bring that down here. And instead of just doing note body, we're just gonna do get title, pass in the note object. All right, so if I go back here in our application title dot dot slice is not a function. So let's see title dot splice slice. Okay. All right, so we trimmed that down. But now we want to generate the date in the body. So we can go ahead and create another method. So we'll just do let actually here, I'll show you what the issue is first. So down here, we'll create a paragraph tag in the paragraph tag. First, we want to generate the timestamp. So we could just do note dot updated. And that's going to generate a timestamp for us, but that looks really bad right now because it has all those extra characters. And we want to make that in a more readable format without taking up all this space. So we're going to create a new method right here, and we're just going to call this get time. And let's create the arrow function. And with this, inside of the return method, there's not that much that we need to do with it. We're just going to generate a new date. And in this date method, we're just going to do note dot updated and we're going to do two local date string here. So we'll pass in the actual note object and let's see why is the return method looking funny because we forgot the equal symbol. Okay. So now down here, we'll do get time. We'll pass in note. All right. And there we go. So that looks a little bit more readable. So, Let's go back here and let's generate the body. So in this case, we had to generate a title for our body. We couldn't just trim it. So we'll just do get content and we'll take in the note object. And to finish this up, we first need to get the title. So that's why we need the title method too. It wasn't an easy trim. So we just have to do title and we'll just do get title. We'll pass in the note. So we get the original title. Then what I want to do is re remove all the new lines inside of our content. So all that space here, we're going to trim it down. So we'll just do content and this is going to be note dot body and we're going to do dot replace all and we're going to replace all the new lines with an empty string like that. So that's just going to basically trim it down. Then we want to go ahead and set our content. So we'll do content and this is going to be set to content. And we just want to remove the title out of the body here. So we'll just do content dot replace all. And this is why we had to get the body so we can get the title here. So any text in the title, we'll go ahead and clear it and remove it from the actual body. So we'll just go ahead and clear that up. And I'll actually create a space here. So we still want spaces here. We want to completely remove it. All right. So the last thing is, is we just need to return this. So we'll just do if the content length if this content length is greater than 45, then let's go ahead and just return it with some dots here. So we'll just do return and we can do content dot slice, not splice zero through 45. And then we'll just add in dot dot dot. So the user knows there is more content else. If not, we'll just go ahead and return the content. Okay, so just three methods are pretty quick here. It just helps trim down the data and we can add that right after the span tag and we'll just do get content and we'll pass in the note. So let's see what that looks like. We have one error, return content slice 45. Return content. Oh, that needs to be a plus. Yep, code is all on GitHub. It's going to be in the video description. There is actually source code right now, but I'm going to update it with this code right here. So here we go. We see that. So for example, right here in today's agenda, we made this the title and then we just added this to the body. And then this lorem ipsum one, because the text is so long, we just added in those three dots. 
uh, insinuating that we have more to deal with. Okay, so I see Shuvo just uh, added in that note. Someone's asking, did I just make a notes app two days ago? Yes, I did. What we're doing here is we're building out a Django backend. And that one, we didn't add in the backend. We use something called a node server and we're using a real Django backend. So at this point, we just trimmed down the data we finished up all the CRUD functionality and we need to talk about how to put this into React. Remember, if you came here just to see how React and Django uh, can be integrated together, I have a video in the link description or a link in the video description. It's 11 minutes long. It shows you how to do that quick. Now, what we're going to do here is try a few different methods. Now, the first one is to keep our two projects completely separated. So right now we have a front end. If you can see my desktop, we have a front end. This is our React application and this is our Django application. And what we just did is we made them communicate together. So we basically linked them up and we're calling an API built from the back end and we connected it to the front end. Now, what I could do is I could deploy this application to Heroku. So, or something like that, I can deploy my Django application with the API and then I can deploy my front end completely yeah, elsewhere. It doesn't have to even know about the Django application. And then we can just make those phone calls, so to speak, those requests, and they can communicate with each other. So we could do it that way. What I'm going to do here is use Django as my full backend here and connect it to host my backend and my React application. Now for this, we're going to get our React application and I need to close out my React code right here. If you want to do things this way and have Django host your React front end, take your React application and bring that into the Django backend if you're following along. So just drag it in there. And now inside of the backend code, you're going to see your API, your virtual environment, and we can now see my notes and the front end. So the React application is now inside of the Django project. So it's really easy to connect these. Once that's done, if we go to, sorry for the squeaking chair, if we go to port 8000 here, so let's go to port 8000, on the homepage right now we have nothing there. So we have our API routes by going to forward slash API. And that's it. So we can see our API, but on the homepage, I want this to be my React project. This is gonna be the user interface that someone sees when they go to my website. So this needs to be the React part. So let's go ahead and connect that. So now that we dragged the React, the React files into the Django project, what I need to do is CD into the React application to start. So we'll go ahead and CD from my Django app to front end. So check the file path, make sure if you're using this from the command prompt that you can see all that. And now we need to run NPM run build. So we did this in the stream two days ago, where this is where we bundle up our files and we create an optimized version of our project. So we have the development environment and we just created the uh, production environment, I guess. So we prep those files and now inside of your React project, you should see this folder called build. So this is what we're actually going to deploy to React. So we just bundled those up and this is basically a copy of everything that we built out. So to connect this to to Django here, uh, we're going to go into our application inside of Django. We'll go into settings.py. And the first thing we want to do is let Django know where to find this index.html file, which is inside of build and right here. So this is now the template that's going to be seen on the front end. So we need to point Django to that. So we'll close everything out here and let's go to front end or my notes settings. And we need to go to templates here and we can just go to base dir, so base directory, and we can point to front end and we're going to build. So we know now that there is a template directory inside of that folder. So front end right here and then build and there's index.html. So Django now knows that we have some templates there. So now what I need to do is configure my react static files because that's pretty much what we have here is static files inside of that build folder we need to configure our React files, static files with Django. So we're just going to go ahead and do static files underscore ders. And this is all inside of the React course too, as far as how static files work and so on. So check that out. It's in the video description or the Django course. And at this point, we could just go to the base directory. So base dir, and we're just going to go into front end and then we're going into build and we're going into static. So we're linking up 
Django to React's static files. So give me one second here. Just want to see some notes. Okay, so we linked that up. We linked up the template. We linked up the static files. And now we can go into our URLs. So let's see, inside of our root directories URLs.py file, we're going to make a quick import. So the first thing is, is we're going to use a class-based view to render that Django or that React template. So we'll do from Django.views.generic. And we're just going to import template view. Now template view is a pretty simple built-in view that Django already has. It's a class-based view and we can just use it to specify the path. We're going to leave this as an empty string right here. So we're basically saying let React handle all the routing from here. So we're going to set that to the home URL. That's why we changed this one to API so it wouldn't conflict with that. And then we're just going to use template view and we're going into template view dot as underscore view because it's a class-based view. This is how they have to be handled. And we can specify the template names, template underscore name. And that is going to be index dot HTML. So we're pointing to front end. We're going into build and we're pointing it to this index dot HTML file, which is our react project. So now if I save this, let's see, I just want to make sure I am on the right path here. So we set up the URL, we set up the static files and the templates. Now on port 8000, because I ran run build, I should be able to go to port 8000. Let's just restart the server and clear everything. So CLS, and then Python manage.py run server. Let's take a look at this. So template view has no attribute as view. Looks like I misspelled something. Okay, so there we go. Now it's back on. And if I refresh this, we should see our React application. All right, what's happening here? Let's inspect that. Did I run run build? I feel like I did that. All right, so let's find the issue really quick. So we have network. All right, let's try this. I'm gonna completely close out the project. Sometimes it helps to just restart it. We'll go ahead and open up our Django application. All right, so my notes will run the build and then we'll turn on the Django server. So we'll do CD front end NPM run build. Give that a second. And then we'll open up another terminal and we'll turn on our Django server. So Python manage.py run server. There was a typo on the last line you wrote. Okay, so as view, uh, I think I just took care of that one, but for some reason the static files are still not being found. Okay, so give me a second to figure this out. It probably is a typo, so front end, and then we're going into build. So in the templates right here, so base directory, front end, and then we're going to build. That looks good. And then down here in static files, we're going into front end build. Oh, start. Why did I do start? Okay, this is supposed to be uh, static. Okay, sorry about that. So now that should show up. Okay, here we go. Here is our same application. So if you look at this, we have our development server. This is on port 3000, but when we're deploying this, this is on 8000. So now Django is officially holding my React project. So if I wanted to deploy this, uh, if you've seen any deployment video or if you know how to deploy a Django project, all you need to do is go through the process of deploying that to Heroku or wherever you wanna deploy it uh, and that's it. And Django would host it. Now, if I wanted to edit this project, uh, if I made any changes, I would still work within my development environment. I would still turn on port 3000, make the changes. Then we have to run build again and then deploy it. So I'll just show you what I mean by that. So if I go ahead and CD into front end and we'll just do NPM start, I got to turn on that development server. I did this in uh, the previous video. So it's going to open up on port 3000. Yeah. So it seems like everyone uh, noticed the misspell. All right. So here's my project on port 3000. So I could just go ahead and go into front end. We'll go into source. 
Let's go into our header and we'll just say new header. All right, so I could just do that and that's gonna update on port 3000, but not on port 8000. This is inside of Django now or how Django is serving it up. So in order for this change to be seen, I would have to go back here, turn off that development server, run NPM, run build. It's gonna bundle up those files, apply those changes and then redeploy it. So now if once run build is run, because my Django server is already on, it's already on right here on port 8000. Let's see, okay, that build is done now. Now on port 8000, if I refresh that, I see new headers. So you have to run build every time you see those changes. So I'm just gonna go ahead and revert that, run that build, and let's see what we wanna do next here. So how's everyone doing, by the way? Let's see, I wanna see what everyone wants to see next. So we'll just do npm run build. I'm trying to see if we have time to deploy it. We're at two hours and 55 minutes. That's a little bit longer than I expected because of the issues that we ran into. All right, so we'll turn that off right there and our server is officially off. Okay, so what do we wanna do next? Uh, I guess we could try to, oh, I wanna show you a few issues here. So um, there's a few things that kind of uh, go on with this. There's some downsides. Uh, one of these is kind of an annoying issue. So if you go to your project, let's turn on our server again. This, these are actually very important issues. And I, uh, I actually address this in my Django React e-commerce course on Udemy. So let's go ahead and turn on our server. Good thing I saw that in my notes. Okay, so uh, if we wanna actually see this here, um, if we go to our React application or our Django version of the application, if we go here and then click on these links, we can see the pages change. So what's happening here is we have React handling all of our routing. So Django is not handling the routing, React is taking care of all this. The problem here occurs if I try to go to this URL manually or do a hard refresh. If I do this, we automatically get an error. So what's happening here? So Django is looking at the URLs here and it's going to this urls.py file. Let's see, let's go back to the root directory. I have so many files open, it's starting to throw me off here. So if we go into the URLs file, Django is looking in here and it's saying, okay, we see admin, we see API, and we see this route, but we don't see this right here, note and then the ID. Now, this is kind of an annoying thing. This is the one of the downsides. It, there's absolutely fixes for it. Some of them are more labor intensive, but they work. And there's also quick fixes, but they don't look as good. So with this, Django goes to that default path. It tries to render that template, but before React's files can get together and, and basically create the page and all the routing, because this is all done in JavaScript, the page already loads and Django can't find this route and we need React to handle it. So again, if we go to it like this by clicking on it, it works, but if we refresh and go to it manually, it won't. Now there's a few fixes. One is a, uh, I would say it's not a really good fix at all, but it works and I would highly recommend against this. Uh, there's probably a way to automate, uh, automate, automate this. But what we could do is we could actually uh, do something like note forward slash and then uh, pass in the dynamic value and then it would just kind of replicate that ID. So we're not gonna do that route. I've seen people do that, but that means that you're literally creating two different URL paths, one in React, one in Django, and that's not a good one. The easier fix that doesn't look good is using something called a hash router. So the React router that we used has something called a hash router instead of a browser router. So what I'm gonna do is change this to hash, and all we do is change that, but we don't have to change anything down here because uh, we still import it as router. And what's gonna happen here is if I go back to my main page, if I go to any of these paths, let's see, do I have to refresh? I think I have to refresh it. Oh, I need to run that build. So give me a second. So we'll just do npm run build. Because I'm using this from Django. Oh, so cd front end. I could use this from the development environment, but uh, it needs to be, because I'm trying to show it in Django, we'll use it from here. Okay, so we're gonna let that build. 
We could also turn on our React environment, so we'll just do, or the development environment, so npm run or start. I keep doing this from the Django project, so front end, npm start. Okay, so let's go ahead and go back here. So right now, if we go to the React application, what the hash router is gonna do is it's gonna put in this uh, pound symbol or hashtag, whatever you wanna call it. It's automatically gonna put that into any part where React is dealing with the routing. So that way, when we go to today's agenda, if we go to this note, we're seeing that pound symbol right there. So if we go to that directly, React will actually handle that. So now if I refresh it, we don't have that issue. Now, if I take that out, that issue will occur because the hash router is not handling that. So it looks a little bit uglier, but it is a quick fix right here. Uh, automatically, if I go to my domain, port 8000, that hash router will be added. So that's a quick fix to it. Um, again, I don't like the way it looks, but if you're not dealing with, um, if you're just trying to get your project up and going, most users might not even recognize that. Uh, just kind of looks funny there, but the hash router actually solves that issue. Another one would be to literally go into Django and, and replicate every single URL and point it to the React project. Uh, definitely not the ideal one. Now there are other um, other methods. I'll recommend looking them up. Just look up um, hash or React router URL routing issues when it comes to uh, server side rendering. Um, that's, I guess, one of the issues in how I'm deploying it because I'm using Django here. Uh, as the back end, we run into this, whereas if I just deploy this to Netlify right away and connected it to my API, this issue wouldn't occur. So there's so many different ways of actually dealing with it. Uh, that's just one of the, the negatives that would come up here. So uh, as far as the API, I don't really see a point in making it RESTful. I could try to do that. So with class-based views or uh, the view sets and routers, it would be easy to make our API RESTful. It's kind of outside of the scope of this tutorial, but um, I guess we can try it. Anybody want to see that where we can make it to where we go to the same URL and just change up the uh, the actual call? If you if you understand what a RESTful API is and how that works, I guess. Here, I'll, I'll just start it. So we have our get notes route, and I would just say, uh, I guess I can leave this route as get notes. And what we can do is make all of these, take all of these routes right here and put them inside of functions. I'm actually trying to think about how to do this. All right. <laughs> Someone says, I didn't notice you were using lorem ipsum since the 1500s. All right, so let's do this. So in class-based views, this would be easy because you create a class and then you specify a different function for each view. Now, I've seen people say, well, that's why you need class-based views because you can't do it with function-based views. It's not the case. You can do everything that you can do with class-based views. It just has to be done different. So let's try this. So we'll go into our API and what I'm going to do here is I'm gonna create a folder and I'm just gonna call this utils right here. So this is gonna be like utility, utility functions. So anything that we just wanna use separately, we'll put in here. And that needs to be a file, not a folder. So let me recreate that new file and we'll just call this utils. I've actually never done this. I just kind of imagined how to do it and it made sense. So I think I can apply it here. So remember that to a RESTful API, our routes need to look like this. So we'll just do this. So if we go to notes, We'll just uh, add in some comments here. So if we go to forward slash notes and we'll add in the comments later, uh, if we get a get request, this will get us all the endpoints or all the notes. If we go to notes and we send a post request, this will create a post. Right now we're going to notes and then we're doing create and that's not very restful. That doesn't follow the restful practices. So we're just gonna go to the same route, but we're sending the post. So what does that mean here for us for our get notes view? Well, really all we need to do is handle the HTTP methods that are being sent to that route. Now, if we go to notes and then let's just say the ID, we'll just pass that in. Uh, then if we do get, that's gonna get us the object. If we do notes and then we pass in the ID, but if we send in a post request, so I'm just gonna write all of them out, or not post, but a put request, this is gonna update our item as long as we send the correct data. And then we can do notes forward slash ID, and we'll have to update our front end for this too, actually. So we'll just do delete. So really, we have two routes, that's it. So 
we have two routes here. I'm going to comment these out. All we have is notes and then note with an ID, but we have one, two, three, four, five different endpoints that we can technically hit with different methods. So we'll save that and let's see how we can do this. So uh, get note and notes. Let's start with notes. So let's do the create view. So what I'm going to do is take this entire method right here. I'm going to comment that out and I'm going to bring that into my utils. So I only thought about this. So if I completely butcher it, I'm sorry, but this is just how I imagined it. I actually never put this into practice. Um, let's go ahead and remove that decorator. Then we want to, uh, okay, hold on a second here. So here's what we'll do. We'll just do if request dot method is equal to get, then we want to do all of this. Whoops. What am I doing wrong here? Control and then there we go. So if the method is get, we'll execute this. If request dot method is equal to post. Again, this is where class-based views are actually cleaner. Um, there's just, it's just possible to do without them. So if the method is post, what do we want to do? So in this case, um, I'll actually write the code in here and then I'll export them as different functions. So if the request method is post, we want to get the data. So we'll paste that in. We want to create the note. And then we want to serialize the note and then we want to return it. So I have to uncomment that. So I promise we'll make this cleaner in a second. Okay, so then we serialize the note and that's gonna be after the create method and then we return it. So let's test this right now. So we'll start with just this route. So now that's all inside of one method here. So if the method is post, we go through exactly what we did right here. So that means on the front end, so I'm gonna turn on my Python server or JSON, my Django server. Here, let's just uh, remove all that for now. So now we have to go to our views or our URLs here and we need to get rid of create node. So that's no longer an endpoint. We'll save that and that should get rid of the issue. And let's just start up our React server, the development server. So now we're gonna stay on port, let's see, we're gonna stay on port 3000 and let's continue here. So in order to create an item, we need to change the URL here. So we'll go back to front end. And let's see, so we'll go into pages, note page, so create note. So now we're just going to notes and we're sending a post request. So that's all we have to change here. So we changed where we're sending that, but as long as the method is right here, inside of the view, we'll read that. So let's see if this works. Let's make sure. So I haven't, again, I haven't implemented it. I don't see any reason why it wouldn't. We send the post method, we return it. That all looks good. All right, so we'll create a new item. Test, done. Let's see what went wrong. Okay, API notes method. Oh, okay, here we go. So the allowed methods, what just happened? We see this error, it told us exactly what happened. We need to allow a post method as one of the methods that can be sent to the backend. So now we can send a get or a post method. So let's try that one more time. We'll just do testing new REST API. So now it's more RESTful. Still did not work. Uh, method not allowed, do I need to refresh that? Let's see, give me a second. Let me try to turn off the server and start it again. Oh, okay, I just, uh, I put all this logic into get note, sorry. So we're gonna take all of this, remove it, and put that into get notes here. So we're gonna add in this logic. So sorry about the copying and pasting. So now we just had to do that to get notes. So I'm just gonna change this indentation. Okay, so get notes now is gonna take in a post method. So that's why it didn't work. Okay, so we do if request method is get on the get notes method. We also allow a post method. If it's post, 
we run this logic right here. So now this should work. We'll just do new note with restful API. Hit submit. There we go. So we just got rid of a URL and all we did was change up the method. So we'll clean up a little bit more in a second, but let's continue down here. So in get note, we also want to, uh, I guess the names here for the actual views should change, but we'll keep it at that. So we want to allow a get, a post, a put method. So a put and a delete method. So we're just specifying all the methods that we can allow. So that's for the get note method. So what I'll do is I'll just leave these commented out right here for anybody looking at the notes here in the GitHub repo once it's uploaded. And uh, let's continue here. So for the update note, we're gonna take all this logic. We can bring that into get note and we'll say if request dot method is equal to put, go ahead and fix this indentation. And there we go. So if it's a put method, we'll run this, we'll update the item. Then in the URLs, we can get rid of update. No need for that. It's making our URL patterns cleaner. Now, now if we go to uh, get note here, I'll probably change the name too. So I can just comment all this out now. I got the hiccups. So I'm trying not to <laughs> try not to have them while I'm talking here. All right. So, now for the delete method, we're just gonna copy all of that and we're just gonna put this in. So this method right here gets, it doesn't actually take post, I just realized, because post will be inside of this one right here. So this is get and post, this is gonna be get, put, and delete. So the last one is gonna be delete. So we'll just do if request.method is equal to delete, go ahead and delete the note. And that's about it. Again, class-based views would make this easier, but if you want to see how they work in function-based views, this can actually help you understand it. So at this point, we need to also change the delete URL. Okay, so that's done. So now we just have our two URLs and let's go into the front end now and update that. So in the front end, we want to modify that. So we'll go into our note page for create note. That's done for update note. We can get rid of update. We can get rid of delete here. So they're all going to the same URL. So I hope that makes sense. Now let's try it, let's test it, let's make sure everything's working. So we'll go in here, new note with RESTful API, we'll do updated, go back. There we go, it's updated. We're sending it to those URLs. If you look at the request here, they're all going to that same path. And also if I want to delete a note, let's go ahead and do note one, delete, get rid of it, it's all working. Cool. So um, that made it restful. Uh, let's clean this up though, because now our views look kind of ugly here. So if you look at this, uh, let's comment this one out too. If you look at this logic right here, there's just kind of a lot of logic inside of one view here. So how would we export this into its own method? So I wanna put this inside of the utils file. So what I would rather do is uh, create a method and it would say something like, uh, let's see, this would be update note like that. And we would just pass in the request object into it. And then what we can do is take all this logic. Let's see. Yeah, so we should be able to grab all this logic right here. I'm going to comment this out just so I don't delete it yet. Then I should be able to go in here. And we'll just do update note. We'll pass in request here. That's the request object here. And we don't need to add in the decorator because this is technically not a view. It's just a method inside of a view. Let's fix all this indentation. And what we'll need to do is import our uh, response method. So we are using this technically. So let's import that. So we do need response. We do need our serializer. So in theory, these serializers could just be brought in right here, so the note serializer. We'll also need the model import, which would mean that we might not even need those inside of our views. So we have the serializer and we have all that. So now I should be able to just call get note. Let's try this. 
I might need to change up the response here. So now if we update the note, we could just do return. I don't think this will actually work, but let's try it. Return update note. That worked. Wait, did it? No, no. Okay, so in that case, we might just have to change the response itself. So we can go into return right here, bring that into our view. So return response and request or update note would simply return our serialized data. So then in our view, Here, let's try this right now. So update no. Oh, I also, you know what I realized? The first time I actually wanna retry this first method because what I need to do is go into my utils file. So from.utils and I first need to import this method. So the first time it actually could have worked but I just wanna see that method first because I actually think that's a lot cleaner. So this is new note and we'll go back. Let's see what the uh, terminal is saying here. So name PK is not defined. Oh, I see. Okay. So what I could do here is So basically inside of this method, we need to get the primary key. I guess cleaning it up won't be as easy. All right, so I guess I, I should pass it in as an optional parameter. So I could just do, uh, I believe I can do arguments like that. And can I, Praveen, if you can help me out here, I see you're in the chat. Uh, I believe I could just do, or keyword args, so quargs. Then I believe I could just do the primary key like that. And then if anything, I can pass that in. So the only thing I'm trying to do is just export the methods so they can be completely separate. Now you can see where a class based fees might actually be nice here, making this a little bit easier. So update note is going to take in, I guess I could just pass in the primary key like that and then just do PK. I don't see why I couldn't do that. Okay. I guess the problem here is that the primary key might not always be actually yeah it would always be sent never mind okay i way over complicated that all right there we go so it worked so in this case this is what we would do we would uh would go through get rid of all this logic, put it inside of its own method. And then if the request method was get, we would just do uh, get note detail or something like that. So we just remove all that and then create a method here. And this one would be called get note detail. Fix that spacing. And so our API is technically RESTful. We're just now cleaning up the actual way that it's working. So we pass that in, return response, serializer data. What just happened here? Okay, so what I could do now is just make sure these are all imported. So we import get no detail, then we can go ahead and bring that down here. So if the request method is get, we'll just return get no detail passing in the request and the primary key. Then we could go into delete. And then we'll just do return delete note like that. And then we'll create that method.
right. So delete note, and then we can bring that in here. All right, does that kind of make sense? I know that took a little bit longer, like it was kind of annoying to do that, but we commented out a lot of this and now we have our RESTful API. This is pretty much what a class-based view would do for you. So depending on the method, we create all these. So what I'm gonna do here is just close it out by just cleaning up this one. So when you see the source code, you can see exactly what's going on. But uh, in this case, we'll just do return get notes list like that. We'll pass in request here and yeah um i think that's going to be it once i finish this up so we'll just put that up here get notes list just wanted to show a, a new method and doing stuff because you see something different it might not be the best approach but at least you maybe understand it a little bit better or see another option for a time when this might be the better solution. Okay, so we're just importing those. I could just do star and import all of them, but I'd rather uh, import them manually. And then the last one would just be get note detail. So uh, in this case, okay, get notes list, and then this would just be an update note method. So we'll just do return update note. All right, we'll pass in request into that. And then we're just gonna quickly Throw in, let's see, what did I call that? Oh, that was supposed to be create note like that. So we can actually pass that request object down like that. So, all right. So I hope you uh, learned something new today with this method and I added in time to the video, but we can just make that import really quick. Let's go ahead and move that to the right, create note, and there we go. So let me just recap this really quick. So if the request method is post, we call create note. If it's get, we get the note list. Then at this view, if it's a get method, we get the detail. If it's a put method, we update the note. And if it's delete, we delete the note. Just to make sure everything's working, we'll go ahead and run through this. So we'll just do new, there we go. Uh, we can update it. So new is updated, we can delete it, that removes it. Our full RESTful API is complete. So RESTful is more of a, a practice and, and a style and how you're building out your APIs. So um, that's gonna be it then. Uh, we won't talk about deploying it. We, at this point, it's like deploying any other Django application. I have plenty of videos in that in my course on my YouTube channel. You can check those out. You're just pushing up your React application or your Django application and React is inside of it. So. Yeah, that pretty much completes it. Let's check the chat. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for the kind words. It's uh, really motivating to be able to do this and, and have everyone in here. Really appreciate it. So, yeah, um, I appreciate it. Yeah, if you like the video, I mean, that if, if it's useful to you, like it. I wouldn't tell you just to like it if it actually helped you, for sure. It would help me, too. So, how to pass an array into some model fields. Well, it depends on what you're trying to do with it. It's You can typically, in a model field, there isn't an array field, I don't believe. Uh, you would stringify that. So you turn it into a string, and then you just have to parse it anytime you're using it. So, yeah. All right, well, I'll end it now before the stream gets any longer. Um, I guess it's at 3.23. I could do a couple more minutes to try to end it at 3.25. So let's see. A lot of, uh, a lot of people that I recognize in the chat have been starting to do this more regularly. It's nice to see familiar faces and names. Um, I'll be prepping some more streams. I'm gonna do a collaboration with Brad. I'm probably gonna do a Django crash course with him, but I do wanna start moving on to more advanced topics. So we'll do that. Um, I am getting into React. We'll be getting more into JavaScript too, but I also wanna make sure the backend developers are also happy with good videos. So, all right, we'll end it here. Thank you so much for joining. We'll see you guys in the next stream.